all the panelists and the speakers. Uh, so good morning from me and assalamu alaikum to all my colleagues. I believe you're muted. Uh, maybe you'd like to unmute yourself, Prof. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I don't know from where it terminated once again. <laughs> Good morning and assalamu alaikum to my colleagues. I'm Dr. Ishtiaq Rasul. I'm the General Secretary of Pakistan Cardiac Society. I welcome you all in this uh, lively webinar, which is jointly organized by Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology and Pakistan Cardiac Society. The topic is pregnant women with heart diseases in Asia Pacific. I must tell you that Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology and Pakistan Cardiac Society has developed very close relationship over the period of last several years and today's webinar is such an example of this activity. It is a great honor for Pakistan Cardiac Society leadership to host this webinar and all the credit goes to Professor Khalda Somro, the chairperson, Scientific Council Pakistan Cardiac Society for women with heart diseases. She is the person, very active person, and uh, she was uh, also the president of Pakistan Cardiac Society. And currently, she is uh, uh, chairing uh, this uh, scientific council of Cardiac Society for women with heart diseases. And her untiring efforts and skills in organizing such events are exemplary. And we notice it every day every month and she is the most active person in our cardiology society. I welcome Dr. Jack Tan, the chief president of Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology and immediate past president of Singapore Heart Society. He is the senior consultant in cardiology in National Heart Center, Singapore. I welcome you, sir, that you are honoring our session and I think we are going to have a productive session. We have with us Professor Uzma Khan. She is Professor of Medicine in University of Missouri and Director for Fellowship Program in Diabetes and Metabolism. Welcome Dr. Uzma. And I think uh, I've just mentioned it is too late and we are very grateful that you are sitting with us in uh, such a late night time. And we are also have with us Dr. Eleanor Lopez. She has joined us from Philippines. She is the past president of Philippines Heart Association and Philippine Society of Echocardiography. She will be speaking on incidence, care, and mortality of pregnant women with heart diseases in Asia Pacific. It's a very interesting topic and very extensive one. And it will be my pleasure and very interesting to see how she can cope up with all these three in one single uh, topic. And uh, together with this, uh, our foreign experts, we have local shining stars uh, of our own cardiology. That is our local cardiologist we have with us. Uh, I don't see him now, but uh, we, have, we must be having him. Professor Harun Baba he is the president of Pakistan Cardiac Society and, and he is professor of cardiology in National Medical University, Multan. We have with us Professor Nusrat Ara Majid. The Honorable Nusrat Ara Majid is the first woman cardiologist in Pakistan. She has that honor. So we must uh, tell you. And uh, because uh, this webinar is for women and most of the participants are women. So uh, this is the honor she is having with her. Uh, with her. And she is uh, now heading the cardiology department in Rawalpindi General Hospital. Professor Ambar Ashraf is with us. She is head of cardiology department in Khyber Medical College, Khyber Teaching Hospital, Peshawar. Uh, we have with us Professor Feroz Memon. He is the immediate past president of Pakistan Cardiac Society and he currently holds the position of vice chancellor and professor of cardiology in this medical college at Tando Mohammad Khan. We also have with us uh, Dr. Nusra Tara Majid just told you that we are seeing him after two centuries, but I am seeing after a month. <laughs> Professor Shabash Qureshi. Dr. Qureshi is an eminent, very renowned speaker in Pakistan and very, a very frequent speaker. He is heading cardiology department at Wasim Medical College, Islamabad. And among the local speakers who are with us, 
our professor amber malik very active cardiologist she is a international cardiologist and she is professor of cardiology and hod at sheikh said hospital in lahore and she was also the general secretary of pakistan society of international cardiology i must tell you she is uh, she has a very good pair of hands in an intervention and today we will look how she speaks on uh, pregnancy and cardiology uh, dr shaib nisa she is associate professor of gynea and ops in ulam mohammad meher medical college sakhar and we also have with us dr sabi naz masood she is head of cardiology sorry head of uh, gynea and ops at isra university so and the last one the most youngest one is dr sanam khaja she is going to moderate this session and after me uh, she will conduct uh, this uh, seminar uh, this event uh, so with this i hand over to dr sanam khaja if uh, and i think so it will be better if we have a couple of words uh from uh, dr jack tan and then uh, uh, dr sanam khaja can moderate the session thank you very much uh, mr chairman so firstly i'd like to congratulate this uh, collaboration by pcs and apsc i'm very privileged to join this uh, panel and uh, i also echo the leadership by professor kalida sumro who has always been very enthusiastic and passionate about this uh, topic and i i'm so happy to see that this panel we have a very good mix of uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, truly and i think this our panel is a uh, perfect uh, to discuss uh, all this issue around either women's cardiovascular heart health as well as pregnancy related uh, matters um so i i again i want to thank uh, the floor and uh, the participants uh, for joining us this saturday for this very important topic and i look forward uh, to have this event uh, posted onto our apsc platforms for on demand consumption so i i really welcome more of this educational efforts from uh, pcs and so that we can all learn from each other i think this is one topic that there's great need to learn from countries like yourself where uh, there are a lot of issues that we don't see in other parts of uh, southeast asia so with that i'll hand the floor back to the chairman for the first uh, speaker thank you uh thank you very much uh, dr jack and uh, i'm privileged uh, to be talking among uh, uh, such big names and uh, we are honored to uh, uh, from the platform of the gurad gunit program pakistan and pakistan cardiac society to organize this program so before we move forward uh, thank you very much dr shtiak for comprehensive uh, uh, introduction of each and every one Uh, but i would like to introduce uh, our honorable uh, secretary of pakistan cardiac society dr isya kasoon as you said that dr isya is currently the head of department uh, of fizaya medical college and uh, and he is uh, currently the general secretary of pakistan cardiac society so uh, uh, from uh, pakistan cardiac society and gored women program we uh, as a team decided that the most important and the emerging problem in the women's health is the pregnancy and heart diseases as we are working every day we see that uh, there a lot of problems are increasing every day uh, we go to the opds we see uh, in our opds that females who ha already have a cardiac problem they are not coming to the opds and they are only coming uh, they are only coming to visit the doctor when they become pregnant and the problem became very overwhelming i have seen lot of patients with pericardium cardiomyopathy i've seen the patient with valvular heart disease and being deteriorating in the second trimester and ending in the acute pulmonary edema in the emergency that is something which need to be looked on although we are working too much on the intervention on the valvular heart diseases but i think that this is the most important and the neglected part uh, uh, in the cardiology so we uh, we from the platform of pakistan cardiac society and gored women program uh, and uh, we decided to discuss this in detail so this uh, webinar is a series of the effort which we have think so before uh, uh, wasting any further time on discussing uh, this i would like uh, we would be having four speakers today for our program and our first speaker for today's program is dr elionor lupus and uh, as uh, as we uh, dr ishtiaq already introduced uh, hello dr elena 
Yes, good afternoon. Dr. Liliana is currently the consultant at the Philippines Heart Center, and she is an advisory member of Asian Federation of Cardiology. She would be discussing today the, awful, the incidence of the pregnancy and heart diseases, especially in pregnant women in the Asia Pacific uh, region. Okay. Over to you, Doctor. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank Professor Jack Tan, President of EPSC, and Professor Harun Aziskan, the President of the Pakistan Cardiac Society, and of course to Professor Kalida Sumru for this opportunity to speak before this uh, important meeting. Now, let me share my my slides with you. I'll be talking on. Uh, Pregnant women with heart disease in the Asia-Pacific region, focusing on incidence, care, and mortality. Now we all know that cardiac disease in pregnant patients can present challenges not only in cardiovascular, but also in maternal fetal management. Some of these diseases may be exacerbations of already pre-existing conditions, or they may develop a new disease because of the complex hormonal changes and physiology of pregnancy. Now, uh, for this lecture, we will look into what is happening or what has happened within the Asia-Pacific region as far as this uh, topic is concerned. I have uh, no conflict of interest with this uh, lecture. Of the objectives of uh, my lecture will be first to discuss the incidence and mortality of heart diseases during pregnancy in the Asia-Pacific region. I will be reviewing some data and general care of the different cardiac diseases seen during pregnancy from various member countries. And lastly, I will briefly present a new concept in the management of the pregnant cardiac patients. Now, when we look at international uh, consensus documents and reviews, they have repeatedly cited an estimated prevalence of 1% to 4% of all pregnancies being complicated by cardiovascular disease. This is particularly true among industrialized countries. If you look at data from the U.S. and uh, probably in more developed countries, most of the heart problems are due to congenital heart diseases. This is due to the fact that rheumatic heart disease has declined significantly in the more developed countries. In our part of the world, that is in the developing countries, rheumatic heart disease still constitute the majority of cardiovascular comorbidities during pregnancy. In fact, in a recently published data, it, has, uh, it is said that pregnancy-related mortality in Asia-Pacific women is 14.2 deaths per 100,000 life births. Now, what could be the reasons for this increased incidence of CV disease in pregnancy? First is a lot of women are becoming pregnant at older ages. Number two, there is a higher prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors in women of childbearing age. And third, there is an increasing number of those with corrected congenital heart disease who are now reaching adulthood. Now, my subsequent slides will be data from the different member countries. I will not be discussing the 22 member countries, but just a handful of them. And this data came uh, from online information and others uh, were provided to me by our colleagues. The first data is from uh, Australia. Now, we know that there is a decline of acute rheumatic fever in many high-income countries so that women with congenital heart disease has become the dominant cohort among the maternal heart diseases in these areas. In this registry from the uh, Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital in Australia, they saw the same pattern. Uh, from the 122 cases that were admitted in that hospital for the periods of 2008 to 2012, 44% of the pregnant women had congenital heart disease. Notice that acquired valvular disease accounted for only 11% of all their cases. Now, when we look at uh, maternal, maternal deaths by cause in, in Australia and in New Zealand as well, there has been a substantial fall in total mortality rate and deaths due to cardiac diseases. However, deaths due to direct cause 
has decreased significantly, but there is a disproportionate increase in indirect causes of maternal deaths. And this is the same pattern that we can see in most high-income countries. Now let's go to a da data from India. This was uh, obtained from a tertiary hospital for the periods January 2017 to 2018. Of the over 9,000 deliveries, there were 108 cases with heart disease with a prevalence rate of 1.12%. And among these conditions, rheumatic heart disease predominated, uh, being documented in 94% of cases. Among the complications that were presented were arrhythmias in the form of atrial fibrillation and heart failure. Now, all of these patients with complications required intensive care management. Uh, we should remember that new onset atrial fibrillation in pregnancy usually indicates an underlying heart disease. Now, uh, this is a small data from Iran looking into the prevalence of heart diseases in women referred to the heart disease clinic for obstetrics for a two-year period. Uh, this was a survey done among those pregnant women coming to the clinics for their follow-up. And uh, 90 women had uh, cardiac disease. There was a, not a very high admission rate at 39%. However, mortality rate was at 7%. And all of these patients uh, who died, uh, died during labor. Among the causes of death uh, mentioned were Eisenmenger syndrome, cardiomyopathy, and severe heart failure. Now looking at uh, Japan, which is a, a more developed country, this data tried to compare the rate of maternal deaths between two periods, that is from 1991 to 1992 and 20 years later from 2010 to 2012. Notice that maternal deaths over total pregnancies or total deaths or total pregnancies rather between the two periods decreased from 9.4 to 4.6 per 100,000 cases. However, deaths due to maternal cardiovascular disease over total maternal deaths increased by three folds from 2.9 to 9.7 percent. Now if you look at the common causes of maternal deaths in the last uh, review that is from 2010 to 2012, you will see that aortic dissection and rupture accounted for five. Uh, four of these five patients had Stanford uh, A, the second uh, highest cause of maternal death was peripartum cardiomyopathy, followed by arrhythmia and, uh, and acute cardiomyopathy. Now, looking at another uh, well-developed countries, this is a single center experience uh, looking at uh, congenital heart disease between the periods of 1995 and 2006. Uh, there were 48, uh, 49 pregnancies uh, enrolled in the Gooch Clinic and among this uh, group of patients, maternal events accounted for 18.4%, predominantly due to pulmonary edema and again, arrhythmia. Among the underlying causes of uh, maternal outcomes were cases of unoperated ASD, subaortic VSD, unoperated PDA, and surgically corrected tetralogy of fallow. Now, based on their population, they were able to come up with certain predictors of maternal cardiac events when uh, dealing with congenital heart diseases. Among the multivariate uh, predictors were pulmonary hypertension, neuric heart functional class 3, and RV dilatation. Now, in terms of maternal care, uh, over 51% uh, underwent cesarean section, mainly because of obstetric indications. Now, there were patients who, went, who underwent surgical or interventional procedure before pregnancy, and this group of patients had more favorable outcomes compared to those who did not go through the same process. The group of patients who had cardio, cardiology counseling before pregnancy likewise manifested lower adverse maternal cardiac event rate compared to those who did not go through pre-pregnancy counseling. Now let's look at uh, the National Obstetrics Registry Report from Malaysia. These were uh, delivery data from 14 tertiary public hospitals. 
the incidence of cardiac disease in pregnancy in that registry was 0.55% uh, in 2013 and 0.45% in 2014. Now, looking at the cause of maternal deaths for the periods from 2009 to 2014, the number or the percentage of in indirect deaths increased a little bit from 51% to 54% in 2014. Um, just one uh, information from Myanmar. This was a 2019 uh, registry data from the Central Women Hospital in Mandalay. Of the over 8,000 admissions of pregnant women, they had a low mortality rate of 0.57%, and 12% of that uh, was mainly due to valvular heart disease, specifically rheumatic and etiology. I will have I will present three studies coming from Pakistan uh, provided by uh, Professor uh, Sumru. The first is the review of maternal and fetal outcomes uh, from January to December in 2018. These were 2,282 cases booked for delivery in the obstetrics and gynecology department of Gula Muhammad Meher Medical Hospital. The prevalence of cardiac disease in that registry was 1.22%, mostly diagnosed during pregnancy. Among the cardiovascular comorbidities, peripartum cardiomyopathy accounted for 43% and rheumatic heart disease accounted for 32%. Maternal mortality was at 14.2%. All four of these patients had uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. Now, this study looked into patients, pregnant patients with moderately severe mitral stenosis from 2008 to 2009. This is from the Department of ob gyne in Gina Postgraduate Medical Center, Karachi. Again, you can see that valvular heart disease comprised the majority of their patients. Of the patients with moderately severe mitral stenosis, 43% uh, were in poor functional class. 20 patients underwent valve replacement. Unfortunately, five had hemorrhagic complications due to anticoagulation and one patient expired. Maternal mortality was at 2.1%. Now, when they tried to look at a possible predictor for maternal mortality, they noted that a PA pressure of greater than 40 had a higher mortality rate of 8.33% compared to those whose PA pressure was less than 40 millimeters mercury. In these patients, uh, 88 or 55 percent had vaginal delivery, and 15 had therapeutic termination of pregnancy. Another paper from Pakistan, this time looking into uh, congenital cardiac lesions in pregnant women, noticed that uh, there were 28 patients with congenital heart disease. Of course, valvular heart disease still overshadowed CHD. Now, looking into the cause of maternal mortality, similar to the, to the previous paper, a PA pressure of more than 40 led to maternal mortality of 8.33%. Now, in this group of patients, two had Eisenmenger syndrome, and both had to undergo termination of pregnancy. One of these two patients uh, expired. Now, I have uh, three papers from the Philippines. This is from the Philippine General Hospital, a tertiary public hospital in Manila. This paper looked into the uh, prevalence of peripartum cardiomyopathy from the periods uh, 2009 to December 2010. The prevalence was one in 1,200 life births, so it is not a very common condition. 78% of these patients presented with moderate to severe heart failure symptoms in the prepartum period. They propose that possible causes of peripartum cardiomyopathy can include obesity, multiparity, and preeclampsia. No mortality was seen in this small group of patients. Now, this second paper um, is uh, looked into the cardiac complications from the periods uh, 2008 to 2013. This was data from the Philippine Children's Medical Center. Uh, patients who are pregnant are sent to this hospital but are co-managed with fellows from the Philippine Heart Center. Now for the five-year period, there were 290 pregnant cardiac cases. Uh, again, majority of these patients had rheumatic heart disease. 
followed by congenital heart disease. And a few with arrhythmias, ischemic heart disease. We had two with uh, TB pericarditis who had pericardiectomy. One had corrected coronary fistula and one had tachyasus arteritis with aortic dissection. Maternal mortality was at 0.7%. The two deaths uh, included one who had mitral and aortic valve replacement who developed cardioembolic stroke at 11 weeks of gestation. One had Eisenmenger syndrome and had uh, pulmonary embolism. Now, in terms of maternal care, 24% uh, underwent cesarean section due to obstetric uh, indications. The one patient who had Takayasu's arteritis underwent directly to aortic surgery after cesarean section. Now, uh, we had to transfer patients, three of them, because that was a children's medical center. So patients had to be transferred to the more uh, appropriate facility. Now, of the three patients, one had severe MS and pulmonary edema, one had acute coronary syndrome on top of RHD, and one had unexplained pulmonary hypertension. The last paper from the Philippines is uh, the, the review of those who underwent PTMC at the Philippine Heart Center from 1989 to 1998. There were 775 cases who underwent PTMC, and 10 of them were pregnant women who were in their mid-age, uh, mid mid-pregnancy. Uh, Two of the patients were in pulmonary edema with low cardiac output. Eight were in poor functional class despite medical intervention. PTMC had complications. We had one mortality. The patient died uh, due to a periprocedural complication of acute severe MR with intractable ventricular tachycardia. One went into premature labor after, after PTMC but was still able to deliver safely to a full-term baby. WAD, who had concomitant lupus nephritis, had intrauterine fetal death. Now, let's go to data from Singapore. This was uh, data uh, obtained from the Joint Cardiac Pregnancy Clinic from 2009 to 2013. There were 60 new cases. Most of them were in uh, WHO Class 1, and a uh, few were in Class 4. Two-thirds of the patients had congenital heart disease, of which 55% were valvular, one-third had acquired heart conditions, 15% were valvular. The common cardiac diagnosis in this group of patients were as follows, mitral valve prolapse in 22%, ASD and VSD, and cardiomyopathy in 16.7%. No maternal mortality was seen in this small group of patients. In terms of maternal care, all pregnant women or all pregnant mothers with uh, acquired or congenital heart disease are referred to this clinic that is jointly run by consultant obstetricians and cardiologists with access to anesthesia and neonatal referrals. Uh, delivery was in a tertiary level ter teaching hospital. Modes of delivery, uh, patients underwent cesarean section with 40% of them emer as emergency basis. Now, looking at uh, data from Thailand, this is from a tertiary care center from 2002 to 2011. Actually, the paper tried to evaluate the CARPREG score in predicting cardiac, obstetric, and neonatal complications. Uh, in this 175 patients, again, RHD accounted for 63% of cases. There were five mortalities. Uh, equivalent to 3%. Among the cardiac events, similar to the previous study, pulmonary edema and symptomatic arrhythmia uh, predominated the picture. Of the five cardiac deaths, there were two who had severe pulmonary hypertension, one had postpartum cardiomyopathy, one had uh, moderate pulmonary hypertension from PDA, and one had severe MS and severe AR, and had to undergo MAVR, but developed cardiac tamponade and eventually expired uh, on the first postpartum day. Now, in terms of maternal care in a tertiary hospital in Thailand, cesarean section was the <clears throat> mode of delivery in 80% of cases. 
The last country is Vietnam, looking at the registry uh, from 2014 to 2016, there were 284 uh, pregnant patients. Most of them were valvular, 40% being mitral regurgitation. A few had ASD and VSD, <coughs> excuse me. And of the cardiac complications, heart failure and cardiac arrhythmia were the predominant uh, manifestation. Palpitation was the most common complaints with breathlessness, excuse me, breathlessness only following second. Now, if you remember, we have been talking about cesarean section in the pregnant cardiac patients. There are certain indications <coughs> excuse me, for doing cesarean section in a pregnant cardiac patient. These are the following patients who are in labor but still on full oral anticoagulations, patients with Marfan syndrome, those with aortic dissection, intractable failure, severe heart failure, severe pulmonary hypertension, and severe obstructive lesions. I will just talk briefly on hypertension since this is most extensively discussed in other uh, venues. Uh, this is the WHO systematic analysis looking at the global causes of maternal deaths. Now, second to hemorrhage is hypertension. Now, if you look at hypertension in our area, it, although it's the second most common cause of maternal deaths at 14%, in the developing region, it accounted for 14% of total maternal deaths, the highest being in Asia from 10 to 15%. Now, to understand why certain complications, including death, occur in pregnancy, we should remember that the complicated hemodynamic changes in pregnancy plus the hormonal and physiologic changes can contribute to the uh, decompensation of uh, pregnant women with conditions such as cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease, or valvular heart disease. Again, we should remember that certain structural changes occur in pregnancy, such as chamber enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy, and cardiac remodeling, which can cause dysfunction in some of the pre-existing cardiac diseases. Uh, it's good to know that cardiac remodeling seen in the maternal heart reverses in six to eight months postpartum. Just a brief word on the WHO classification, uh, increasing from class one to four, maternal cardiac event rate increases corresponding to the uh, level of uh, WHO classification. So from as low as 2.5 to as high as 100%, if you go from class one to class four, and import, more importantly, the care during pregnancy as well as the location of delivery also varies. So in the less complicated uh, cardiac conditions, they can deliver and can be followed up in a local hospital. But the more complicated cardiac conditions may require expert care uh, from obstetrician and cardiologist. Now what is new? In the AC guideline in 2018, they introduced the cardio-obstetric team which is a new concept that will uh, establish a multidisciplinary care to look into various phases of pregnancy from pre-pregnancy counseling to postpartum. Uh, somebody will be discussing this, I'm sure, later on, but just a brief look on what comprises the pregnancy heart team. Patients who are or pregnant patients who are in classified as uh, WHO class one, may require the obstetrician there and consultation with the cardiologist. But once we begin to deal with those under class three or four, then we see a lot more specialists who should be taking care of our patients. So in summary, key learning points from the lecture, rheumatic heart disease, followed by congenital heart disease are the common heart diseases of pregnant women seen in the Asia Pacific region. Maternal mortality ranges from zero to 21%. Among the most common cardiac events during pregnancy uh, present with heart failure and arrhythmias, predictors of cardiac events include your New York Heart Class 3 and PA pressure of more than 14. Now, it is important that pre-pregnancy surgical intervention and cardiac counseling be completed to result in more favorable outcomes of pregnancy and lastly, the pregnancy heart team can be essential to improve cardiovascular outcomes 
and reduce mater maternal mortality in pregnant patients with heart diseases. So with, like, with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and salamat and mabuhay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lucas, for such a comprehensive discussion and uh, summarizing the huge data and piling up a lot of uh, research papers uh, into five, uh, five to 10 minutes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, before we move to the next speaker, uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Honorable uh, President of Pakistan Cardiac Society, Dr. Harun Babar. Uh, Dr. Harun Babar is with uh, us, and we are honored to have uh, Dr. Harun Babar with us. He is the head of Pakistan Cardiac Society, and he's currently serving as a head of the Department of Cardiology of Nishtar. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hodja, for inviting me to this uh, valuable and very informative, uh, informative session. Well, we have uh, definitely in the last uh, half an hour learned a lot what has been going on with the woman in pregnancy related to the cardiac events. And uh, we have a lot of uh, statistics which shows that, of course, cardiac failure and arrhythmias are the main events which cause problems during, which can cause problems during pregnancy. And this was a very comprehensive and detailed and I would say an excellent presentation by the professor. And I welcome all the panelists and the chairmen sitting there. And uh, we hope we will learn much more uh, in the coming time about what is going on in this uh, part of the world, especially Asia Pacific uh, with the women who are suffering from cardiac problems during pregnancy and how we can treat them and how we can investigate them. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. I, I think she might have a uh, drop off uh... Can, can I just make some quick uh, comments about the lecture? Um, Eleanor gave a fantastic lecture, I thought. I, I wasn't aware there, were, there was so much publication and data across uh, Asia, actually. So thanks for showing us uh, this uh, data. And um, can I actually just ask a question, Eleanor? Uh, rheumatic yes, heart go disease, ahead, Jack. Uh, rheumatic heart disease seems to be a major issue uh, for pregnant ladies. Is it routine then in all these uh, countries that uh, they, they do get a cardiac examination or how is this picked up? They are referred by the gynecologist or do they know their rheumatic heart disease when they are pregnant? Um, it depends where they come from. If they are within the greater, um, within the city, the uh, obstetrician are probably more aware that these patients, if they auscultate, if they hear anything wrong, then they are referred. Uh, but in the more rural areas, is, this is not probably so. Uh, in one data, you can see that 75% already knew that they were pregnant, or I mean, did not know that they were pregnant and were only diagnosed during pregnancy. So it really depends on where you are. But there must be some increased level of awareness considering that we are still in that area of the world where RHD is still a very high uh, has still high, uh, high incidence and uh, prevalence. Thanks. Dr. Lopez, I have a question for you. Yes, that, Dr. Uh, in your presentation, why I am Dr. Istiak from Pakistan. Yes, uh, So Dr. I have a question for you is uh, uh, that uh, uh, in uh, uh, your uh, data from Philippines, the uh, cesarean section rate was uh, quite high. That was around 80% as compared to other part of the world, like in Pakistan, India, and uh, Indonesia, yes. that's around 50-60%, and uh, you yes. have jumped to 80%. What's the reason behind that? Uh, these patients were really the complicated cases. 
as I mentioned, patients are referred if we pick up patients from the Philippine Heart Center. By the way, the Philippine Heart Center and the Philippine Children's Hospital are just uh, you know, walking distance from each other. So if we get to see pregnant patients at the Philippine Heart Center and they are diagnosed to have rheumatic heart disease, they are referred to the Philippine Children's Medical Center. Now, because these cases are complicated, they almost always eventually go into cesarean section. The, I mean, uncomplicated cases are just referred to the more to the general hospital. Uh, for example, if we go by uh, WHO classification, if they are in class one or two, then they are referred back to their hospital of origin. So we get only the more complicated cases. That's why the population may be uh, not really randomized. There is a biased uh, selection of patients that we gathered from that paper, considering that we only accept or refer uh, complicated cases to the Philippine Children's Medical Center. I just want to uh, give one comment is that uh, your data was very original and really practical that uh, you showed that the pulmonary hypertension is really a, a big issue and uh, it is a cause of mortality. And I must tell you that in our center we were doing and we are doing a percutaneous mitral commissurotomy since uh, last 20 years. And we have changed very much our strategy during the last decade that uh, whenever we see the patient with pulmonary hypertension, we are more aggressive, especially the pregnant woman. And, uh, we do them uh, the mitral valvuloplasty in the in the in the last eight months alike in the end of that and uh, in the beginning we were not doing that but during the last uh, decade we are more most frequently we ask them to come and check the pulmonary artery pressure and uh, we yes. invite them and especially perform because we you rightly said that that influences uh, the uh, mortality and 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 the complications during uh, during delivery. Yes. Thank you. And con yes, uh, considering that it can be easily, easily obtained using echocardiography. Yeah. Right. Uh, before we move forward, uh, I would like to ask you uh, ask one question, Dr. Lupes. If we come up to a nutshell, and uh, uh, we would like to know that uh, out of the data we have gathered till now, if we want to number only three topmost diseases in the women during pregnancy out of the data, what you label them? I would say rheumatic heart disease is number one. We have congenital heart disease. And third would be uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lupes. We are now moving toward our next speaker. I'm very much overwhelmed to call my uh, one of the most senior uh, and uh, my favorite uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, Amber Malik. Dr. Amber Malik is the head of the department of cardiology at HJZ uh, Hospital Lahore. And uh, uh, she is the psychiatry, uh, former psychiatry of Pakistan uh, Cardiac Society, Interventional Cardiac Society. And she would be talking today that how to address basically the prenatal and antenatal and the postnatal care in the patient in the, during the pregnancy for the cardiac diseases. Over to you, Dr. Amber. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, for your kind introduction, uh, Dr. Khwaja. Um, I would be I am honored uh, to be speaking at this great forum, and it's a great uh, uh, pleasure and an honor to be part of this. Uh, great galaxy of uh, people sitting in front of me. Thank you, Dr. Ishtiaq, for your uh, very kind remarks. And yes, it is a change of gear for me uh, from interventional cardiology to talk about pregnancy and heart disease. As Dr. Ishtiaq uh, rightly mentioned, my main uh, domain remains interventional cardiology, which has always been, uh, uh, and Dr. Khalda Sunu was insistent. So we do a lot of general cardiology as well in our practices. And having listened to Dr. Eleanor Lopez's uh, uh, talk, I think uh, it, 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 it was fantastic and, uh, and such uh, clear data uh, from all over the Asia Pacific region. And I've been looking up some data from Pakistan as well. And uh, she actually presented to me so much uh, uh, Pakistani data. So that's really great. Uh, and uh, my talk is actually more geared towards, I'll put up my screen now, 
uh, is more geared uh, towards uh, our PGs and our young people here who will be listening and would like to and want to uh, understand what it's all about it, pregnancy and heart diseases. I think it will uh, cover uh, a lot of, uh, I'm not covering management particularly because I understand there's another whole talk on management. So, and it's a, and it's a huge topic to talk about cardiac diseases in pregnancy. Uh, I mean, uh, how to put it together. So let's see what we can do in the next uh, 15 to 20 uh, minutes and keep yourselves engaged. Uh, I have, uh, data has already been presented by Dr. Lopez. So I will quickly go through, there will be a lot of, uh, 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 there will be a lot of overlap in all these slides and, uh, and other people's talks as well. So I will uh, bear with me and uh, let, uh, let me just talk about um, cardiac diseases in pregnancy. There will be some talk about their prenatal and antenatal diagnosis. So we already know that uh, cardiac related illnesses contribute a lot in pregnancy and a lot of their about 13.5%. There's a figure here that you can see. Dr. Lopez presented some great figures with an average worldwide of one to 3%. And, and, uh, and as we looked at the data, really developing countries, rheumatic heart disease was still the most common and developed countries had more congenital heart disease. And as pregnancy in patients with heart disease, is becoming more common due to its early diagnosis and better treatment. We're finding that in our region as well. I pulled up just six months data from a tertiary care center in which about 769 patients were admitted. And this is a cardiac center we are looking at. And the number of pregnant patients that presented with heart disease was 37. There was no, mater uh, there was no maternal mortality there. And the, and the the all-cause fetal mortality was about 10%. And two patients lost their fetuses, one because of hypertension and one with a stuck valve. And about 54% had C-sections and 46% had spontaneous vaginal delivery. And the mean duration of admission in the wards was about 3.1 days. The interesting thing over this is this is a cardiac center in which people are presenting with obstetric disease. So if you looked at uh, uh, the data that was coming from uh, with Dr. Lopez presented was coming from uh, uh, from general hospital or from a gynae hospital, obstetric hospital, you had more patients presenting uh, with cardiomyopathy and dying uh, uh, because of that. Here you had people who already actually known to have cardiac disease. So if you look at this, these figures uh, from all of these, it, it is, you can see that overwhelmingly rheumatic heart disease is the, uh, is the major percentage that is presenting to these patients. Prosthetic valves was also about 24%, but these were also underlying rheumatic heart disease patients. The preponderance of patients is rheumatic heart disease. And then comes congenital heart disease and then others. Others, when I say others, it actually means the breakup is over here, which involves tetralogy of fallows, chronic hypertension, various other kinds of complex congenital heart diseases, pulmonary hypertension, cardiomyopathies. But as you can see, people who develop peripartum cardiomyopathy are presenting to gynae units because they actually do not, they're not known to have cardiac disease and patients with known cardiac disease tend to present to cardiac units themselves. So, so the percentages of rheumatic heart disease and the, and, and the incidence actually fits in with all the the data that Dr. Lopez provided to us. So let me just come on to the more uh, uh, meat of the uh, presentation in which uh, I will just uh, uh, break up into what are the kinds of diseases that are uh, uh, responsible for a presentation uh, at, uh, in pregnancy. You have acquired rheumatic disease, acquired disease and congenital. Acquired is rheumatic, ischemic, and cardiomyopathy, and congenitals will be asynotic and cyanotic, out of which the obstructive lesions are the worst ones, which is aortic stenosis, co ops, and pulmonary stenosis. And other important conditions that you need to work, uh, look out for is arrhythmias, infective endocarditis, Marfan syndrome, mitral valve prolapse, pulmonary hypertension, and Eisenmenger syndrome. We already know that as cardiologists, what should we know about pregnancy? We must know that the blood volume goes up during pregnancy by about 40 to 50 percent and increases in labor and delivery again, it comes down postpartum. Heart rate will go up and that's why you have a lot of people, young girls presenting with palpitations and they come in by the dozen to you that they have a lot of palpitation. So uh, cardiac output will go up by 30 to 50 percent and there will be an additional increase of about 50 percent. Blood pressure must go down if it goes up. That means the patient has hypertension. Stroke volume goes up and there will be another rise during labor and delivery. Systemic vascular resistance initially decreases and then rises and then come back again. 
or we will just go forward. The normal physiological changes that you must listen for and know and understand that they are not abnormal. Our third heart sound in up to 90%. There's systolic ejection murmur that you will hear from hyperkinetic flow and there will be most auscultatory changes will resolve in one to two weeks postpartum. You must look for ECG changes which are normal in pregnancy and beyond that is something else. So do not get mixed up with that left axis deviation. There will be sinus tachycardia, there will be STD changes, there will be maybe a small Q inverted P's or T waves in lead three, increased R wave amplitudes in leads V1 and V2 and atrial or ventricular ectopics. So you have to understand that these will be normal changes and there will be echocardiographic changes in pregnancy. There will be an increased, uh, uh, the echocardiography is your mainstay of diagnosis in, uh, in pregnancy and heart disease. And majority of the time, that will be the only test that you will require unless and until the patient is sick, gets admitted to CCUs and you are looking at uh, arrhythmias and other routine cardiological problems. So slightly increased end diastolic volume and systolic volume is normal. Slightly Slightly improved left ventricular function, it may be hyperdynamic, enlargement of ventricular dimension, slight enlargement of left atrial size. There may even be a small pericardial diffusion, and that's normal. Tricuspid annulus diameter will be increased, and there will be functional TR, so that's not pulmonary hypertension necessarily. So you need to, uh, uh, to understand and go with that. It's important to risk stratify these people. We must understand what lesions we are looking at and can uh, stratify into them into group one, two, and three according to their mortality. Mortality less than 1%, uncomplicated AST, VST, PDA, so those congenital hearts, pulmonary and tricuspid valve disease, corrected to, uh, TOF, bioprosthetic valves, mitral stenosis with uh, uh, functional class one and two, and Marfan's with normal aortic root will do well. 5 to 15% is reasonably high mortality. You have to be careful with them. They're usually co-ops of aorta without valvular involvement, uncorrected TOF, mechanical prosthetic valves because of the anticoagulation involved with them, mitral stenosis with AF or class three or four functional class, aortic stenosis and severe pulmonary stenosis, previous myocardial infarction, and as we discussed in detail, pulmonary hypertension. And then whenever pulmonary hypertension comes in, primary or secondary, the mortality really goes up by 25 to 50%. Eisenmenger syndromes and co of aorta with valvular involvement. So those are the lesions that you have to look out for. What are the effects on the fetus? What are you looking at? Preterm delivery, fetal growth restriction, fetal death, and the risk of congenital heart disease in patients who have congenital heart disease. So the important part in antenatal management and diagnosis is preconceptual counseling. You have to check the current fitness and status of the patient. This is if you know if they have uh, heart disease. When they present during pregnancy, that's a different game altogether. But when you have, and which increasingly now with more education and more progress, progress you are getting patients who are already know uh, that they have uh, underlying cardiac condition. So you must anticipate their complications both to mother and fetus. Correctable surgery or, or intervention must be offered earlier and advice against pregnancy in certain situations. Information about congenital heart disease to their offsprings and you prevent an unwanted pregnancy and avoid the risks associated with pregnancy continuation or termination. And when will you therapeutically abort them? Absolute indications are for severe pulmonary hypertension, Eisenmenger syndrome, pulmonary vasoclusive disease, dilated cardiomyopathy with heart failure, Marfan syndrome with dilated aortic root, cyanotic congenital heart disease, and severe aortic stenosis. And termination should be done within 12 weeks. After that, the risks of termination are greater than those of continued pregnancy and normal delivery at term because of associated risks of infection, fluid overload, or need of anesthesia. And the causes of maternal deaths, as we have discussed earlier as well, are really uh, with purpural cardiomyopathies, myocardial infarction, aortic dissection, primary pulmonary cardiomyopathy and myocarditis, primary and secondary pulmonary hypertension, arrhythmias, uh, and endocarditis infection. Cardiac events which have caused complications are heart failure, pulmonary edema, arrhythmias, TIAs and stroke, thromboembolism and sudden death. And what would be the precipitating factors that you need to look at and diagnose? Anemia, increased physical activity, fluid or dietary excess, infections, acute rheumatic carditis, infective endocarditis, cardiac enlargement, twins and hydramnios, excessive weight gain, beta adrenergic agents, older age group, gestational age more than 20 weeks, and arrhythmias. 
And there's a predictor that you can say, which is nope, which is functional class is more than two. Aortic valve area is tight or, or valvular and outflow tract obstruction so that aortic valve or mitral valve area is severe. Left ventricular outflow tract peak gradients are higher than 30 and you've had prior cardiac events or ejection fraction is less than 40%. These are some of the recommendations that the American Heart Association gives for pre-pregnancy and antenatal evaluation. Basically, mainstay is transthoracic echo for all native valve stenosis. They must undergo transthoracic echo before pregnancy. And during pregnancy with severe valve stenosis, they should undergo pre-pregnancy counseling by people who are well-versed in managing patients. Uh, with patients uh, should be referred for valve operations before pregnancy, should receive pre-pregnancy counseling. Uh, and as you can see, these are class one uh, uh, indications uh, for that. Pregnant patients with severe valve stenosis should be monitored in a tertiary care center where there is an appropriate heart valve team. Um, what happens in valvular heart disease? There is an increase in uh, stenosis in transvalvular gradients and there's a decrease in cardiac output. In regurgitation, there is an increase in cardiac output and a decrease in systemic vascular resistance. As a rule of thumb, stenotic, severe stenotic lesions are not tolerated well, whereas regurgitant lesions are generally well tolerated if cardiac decompensation does not occur. Mitral stenosis is responsible for most of the morbidity and mortality of rheumatic heart disease during pregnancy. Moderate to severe MS is poorly tolerated. The rate of fetal morbidity, including fetal growth restriction and preterm birth, rises with the severity of MS from 14% in pregnant patients with mild MS to 28 and 33% in pregnant patients with moderate and severe MS. And the statistics already given corroborate with these statements. In aortic stenosis, usually childbearing age, the main cause of aortic stenosis is congenital bicuspid aortic valve. And it carries a 15% risk of a similar anomaly in the fetus. However, uh, in, in our part of the world, we see a lot of aortic stenosis with rheumatic heart disease, but usually it is associated with mitral valve disease as well. Exercise testing is recommended in asymptomatic patients before pregnancy to confirm asymptomatic status and evaluate exercise tolerance. So that's something uh, which uh, can be looked at with blood pressure response, arrhythmias, and or the need for interventions. And women with bicuspid aortic valve, aortic diameters should be assessed before and during pregnancy. The maternal risk is related to the severity of aortic stenosis. Mild to moderate may be tolerated well. And patients with severe aortic stenosis may sustain pregnancy well as well as long as they remain asymptomatic. Heart failure occurs in 10% of patients and arrhythmia is in about 3 to 25%. Uh, women with bicuspid aortic valve have a risk of aortic dilatation and dissection. So it is re uh, uh, reasonable to in asymptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis to have exercise testing done before pregnancy. Valve intervention is also reasonable before pregnancy for asymptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis. All patients, uh, next we come on to native valve regurgitation. All patients with suspected valve regurgitation should undergo clinical evaluation and transthoracic echo before pregnancy. All patients with severe valve regurgitation should undergo pre-pregnancy counseling by a cardiologist. And these are important to understand. AR is generally well tolerated in pregnancy. And in a young woman, AR may be due to a congenitally bicuspid valve, but again, in our part of the world, it may well be because of, uh, uh, because of, uh, uh, because of rheumatic heart disease. AR without left ventricular dysfunction is also usually well tolerated in patients. And with symptomatic patients and decompensated heart failure, diuretics, digoxin, and hydralazine may be used for after load reduction. These patients should be monitored again in a tertiary care center and exercise testing can also be done for them. For MR, the most common cause of MR during pregnancy is either rheumatic heart disease or mitral valve prolapse. MR is usually well tolerated in pregnancy and atrial fibrillation and hypertension may sometimes cause acute symptomatic decompensation. Let me tell you that mitral regurgitation is really one of the most common lesions that I have seen in my practice. And, and these girls have really done reasonably well. And I have uh, families and, and patients whom I have actually managed through for the last 10, 15 years, give, have them had a couple of children on, on to replace their valves or treat them. Uh, 
not so for mitral stenosis, you have to intervene for them with PTMC even during pregnancy. Prosthetic wells offer excellent hemodynamic performance and long-term durability, but the need for anticoagulation increases fetal and maternal mortality and mobility. And it's a problem in our country uh, uh, in order to, to educate people for uh, INR control. Bioprosthetic valves offer good hemodynamic performance and are much less thrombogenic, but it is associated with a high risk of structural valve deterioration, and they will eventually go on to need a reoperation. Pregnancy is well tolerate, tolerated in patients with bioprosthetic valve. With mechanical prosthesis and anticoagulation, hemodynamically, women with well functioning mechanical valves tolerate pregnancy well. And current evidence indicates that oral anticoagulation throughout pregnancy under strict INR control is the safest regimen for the mother. Unfractionated uh, heparin and low molecular weight heparins do not cross the placenta and embryopathy does not occur. Substitution of oral anticoagulants with unfractionated heparin in weeks six to 12 greatly decreases the risk. So that's an important point. All patients with prosthetic valves should undergo clinical evaluation and baseline transthoracic echo before pregnancy. All patients with a prosthetic valve should undergo pre-pregnancy counseling by a cardiologist with expertise in managing patients with valvular heart disease and transthoracic echo should be performed in all pregnant patients with the prosthetic valve if not done before pregnancy. And repeat transthoracic echo should be performed in all pregnant patients who develop symptoms. T should be performed in all pregnant patients with the mechanical prosthetic valve who have experienced obstruction or an embolic event. So standard procedures. Pregnant patients should be with mechanical prosthesis should only be managed in a tertiary care center with a heart valve team. And that is extremely important because they should not land in areas where there is no cardiologist. Uh, it's a complicated slide, but basically, uh, essentially, uh, I will leave management to my other colleague who can then talk about anticoagulation. What about peripartum cardiomyopathies? It is a form of dilated, that is also one of the problems that a lot of patients present with uh, in pregnancy. A form of dilated cardiomyopathy with LV systolic dysfunction that results in the signs and symptoms of heart failure it develops in the last month of pregnancy or the first five months after delivery. And there is usually absence of heart disease prior to last month of pregnancy. There's no identifiable cause of heart failure and there's LV systolic dysfunction. Etiology remains unknown. Associated risk factors are age over 35, twin pregnancy, gestational hypertension, multiparity. Mortality rate is quite high and the clinical findings are standard with left ventricular failure, dyspnea, edema, tachycardia. The clinical course varies. 50 to 60 percent of patients uh, may demonstrate complete recovery within the first six months. The rest of the patients demonstrate either further clinical deterioration leading to heart transplant or premature death. No agreement on recommendation for future pregnancies. Pregnancy is contraindicated if there is cardiomyopathy and cardiac What about ischemic heart disease in pregnancy? Pre prevalence is overall low in pregnant women but there is a variable presentation from asymptomatic to cardiogenic shock or sudden cardiac arrest. Its incidence and prevalence of myocardial infarction and ischemia related to pregnancy is beginning to rise as more women are delaying childbearing to later years with the technical definition of an age more than 35 years as advanced maternal age. And you will be surprised to know that with the prevalence of ischemic heart disease in our country in young people, the lo a lot of diabetes in Pakistan, we see an increasing number of women with coronary artery disease, atherosclerotic coronary artery disease in childbearing age. And they go on to develop, uh, and they do go on to become pregnant also, carrying ischemic heart disease. So we do run into this problem. The major etiologies, however, for uh, for ischemic heart disease in pregnancy remains a spontaneous coronary artery dissection in majority of patients. Then comes atherosclerosis, thrombus, and then normal coronary anatomy, which falls in the heading of Minoka. Pathophysiology is in women includes a greater proportion of non-obstructive coronary disease than found in men. However, patients with stable angina and normal coronary arteries or non-obstructive plaque burden have been shown to have increased risks for major cardiovascular events later on as well. And they may present with chest discomfort, dyspnea, or then otherwise more atypical symptoms such as referred pain, nausea, 
or profound fatigue. And ECG and assessment of cardiac biomarkers are essential as per practice guidelines. And the predominance is in the third trimester or in the postpartum period. Pulmonary hypertension, primary and secondary. Maternal mortality ranges from 30 to 70 percent. Fetal loss exceeds 40 percent. And the mother is most vulnerable during the time of labor and delivery and in the first postpartum week. It needs to be recognized early in pregnancy and interruption of pregnancy is advised. Pulmonary vasodilators can be used and intravascular vests and women if they are symptomatic. Uh, intravascular volume depletion puts these patients at very high risk. And at the time of labor and delivery, you need to intervene and, advise, and provide adequate fluid administration and oxygen inhalation. Commonest cause is Eisenmenger syndrome. If pulmonary hypertension is more than 60% of systemic levels, complications are very likely. Maternal mortality is high, more than 50%, and 80% uh, deaths during the first postpartum months. The high incidence during labor and perperm. And as we mentioned earlier, the mode of delivery is C-section. What about congenital cardiac diseases? ASTs, VSTs, and PDAs tolerated well. Asynotic lesions, some areas, coaptations, obstructions, uh, and synotic lesions, tetralogy of fellows. These are the common congenital cardiac diseases. Prognosis usually depends upon uh, their uh, functional class. If it's one to two, maternal mortality is low for asynotic cardiac diseases. It can be a bit high at 6.8% if the functional class is higher. Fetal mortality is negligible in class one functional class and can be high for class four. Synoptic cardiac disease uh, uh, is, uh, carries a lot of uh, uh, mortality for fetal death, low birth weight and immaturity. For septal defects and left to right shunts, uncomplicated pregnancy. Possible complications are arrhythmias, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, and as we know. So what about AST? AST is the commonest defect, ostium secundum, and very well tolerated. Paradoxical embolus by shunt is possible. VSTs, isolated VSTs, well tolerated. However, with shunt reversal and pulmonary hypertension, the same uh, principle applies. And if there is congestive cardiac failure and pulmonary hypertension, then total fetal loss is up to 20%. For PDAs, mild and moderate sized, again, uh, the risk of infective endocarditis during delivery but well tolerated. Moderately restrictive, the risk of heart failure is a little bit higher, but majority of them tolerate pregnancy well. If there is pulmonary hypertension, then can cause death. Pulmonary stenosis also well tolerated. Severe pulmonary stenosis can be corrected, should be corrected prior to conception. During pregnancy, balloon dilatation can also be offered. For coact, if there is hypertension, then there is risk, increased risk of aortic rupture or dissection and of cerebral hemorrhage. So lip, uh, uh, should limit, you should limit physical uh, activity and control blood pressure. For fallows, there are four components that we know of, ventricular septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, overriding of aorta, right ventricular hypertrophy. It's a common synotic congenital heart disease in pregnancy. And patients with prior surgical repair, good exercise capacity, and minimal residual disease will tolerate pregnancy well. Pregnancy exacerbates the right to left shunt, and poor prognostic signs are increasing hematocrit and, uh, uh, when oxygen saturation drops below 80%. Sudden decrease in SVR can lead to intense cyanosis, syncope, and death. And we'll come to some of our last topics, which is Marfan syndrome does exist, and it is autosomal dominant genetic disorder, which is characterized by weakness of the connective tissue. And we all know these are standard uh, uh, lesions resulting in joint deformities, ocular lens dislocation, and weakness of the aortic wall and root which is why it can uh, result in aortic insufficiency and aortic dissection. And patients with Marfan's poses two problems. It, can, it is the cardiovascular complications of the mother and the risk of having a child who inherits Marfan syndrome. Cardiovascular complications would be dilatation of the ascending aorta leading to AR and heart failure and dissection of the aorta with possible involvement of the coronaries. Obstetrical complications will include cervical incompetence, uh, postpartum hemorrhage, and abnormal placental location. So preconception counseling is very important, particularly for both for the mother and the further for the uh, fetus and the infant uh, for developing uh, Marfan syndrome. 
For Eisenmenger syndrome, again, we mentioned high risk for maternal morbidity and mortality, poor fetal outcome, death due to RV failure with cardiogenic shock. In reality, they should be advised against pregnancy, should not present with pregnancy, and termination is indicated. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amber, uh, for such a fantastic talk and uh, summarizing uh, valvular uh, ischemic heart disease and uh, the wide spectrum of the diseases uh, in the pregnancy within, uh, within 10 to 10 minutes. So uh, just uh, a quick uh, uh, concluding remark I would like you to make that what, what five uh, or what entity you would recommend that should not get pregnant? I think it is very clear like from, the talk and, yeah, from the talk and previous pregnancy and previous uh, uh, talk as well, that people who have a severe pulmonary hypertension and uh, ob severe obstructive lesions, uh, cardiac lesions uh, should not have, uh, uh, should not have, uh, undergo pregnancy. Patients right. who have their heart failure who are in class three, four functional heart, functional class, whatever the underlying cause. Patients who have primary or secondary pulmonary hypertension, those who have cyanotic congenital heart disease, severe disease, they should not undergo pregnancies. Unless right. they are uh, Unless Can I ask a quick question? Uh, just out of interest, that was a fantastic summary of uh, the data. I, I'm not familiar with this view, but uh, can I ask what is your observed rate if uh, unsuspecting uh, ladies do get pregnant while on warfarin and you only find out week 10, week 12? Uh, is, do you observe any issues with that so far? Although it's I not think just, uh, I don't have any uh, solid data in hand, but uh, what, uh, we have not found any problems uh, with, uh, with uh, you're, you're talking about teratogenicity and fetal outcome, right? Uh, and or, or hemorrhage uh, uh, later on. So we have then continued them on warfarin right till the last trimester, and then maybe switch them to uh, uh, to, to to low molecular weight warfarin. Uh, uh, <coughs> can I can I just say a word, uh, Doctor Amber? Is it possible that uh, when you are uh, orally anticoagulating your patients to have uh, valvular heart disease and uh, bioprosthetic or prosthetic valve, metallic prosthetic valves, you would consider the dose of uh, warfarin to be very uh, important if you were to continue it or not. For example, in one of your slides, which you skipped quickly was that if it is less than five milligram, then you can continue with it. But if it is beyond five milligram that the patient requires for oral anticoagulation, then in that case, you would switch them over to a low molecular weight heparin and monitor the 10A, anti-10A factor in these patients. Because the higher dose of warfarin results in complications in these patients. Would you agree to that? I would agree to that, but I would have a lot of problems doing that. Uh, and uh, what happens is that uh, a lot of these people uh, are uneducated or they are coming from a lower socioeconomic background and that is why the, uh, it is difficult for them to follow orders. But uh, as many a patients I have done and I have switched them to low molecular weights heparins for a very, very long time uh, 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 following uh, this kind of a, a, a chart. And I'll just put this up for a uh, share screen if you like. Um, how do I do that? Yeah, and that's where it says. This is the slide you're mentioning, right? Yeah, you see here, for example, baseline warfarin dose less than five milligram. Yeah, first trimester, and can warfarin first trimester. with low high monitoring or you can put them on low molecular weight heparin. So my more educated patients, I have put them on low molecular weight right from the start, whenever we found out they were pregnant and continued with them. But uh, uh, in the and first, uh, it, this slide if does- you have baseline, yeah. If you have baseline warfarin, more than yeah. five milligram. More than five milligram, yeah. There you would actually 
as it is mentioned here, you would go to low molecular weight heparin and monitor the NT10A. I cannot uh, monitor, uh, monitor the NT10A, you know but, that. But if I know, but I think it is better to prevent any other effects which can occur both to the, uh, the fetus and to the mother and uh, give them low molecular weight heparin if it is if you require more than five milligram of porphyrin and uh, that, that, that's exactly what that is what we have been doing that is what we have been doing throughout in these patients who had severe mitral stenosis or had mechanical valves they were put on low molecular weight heparin throughout the pregnancy uh, i completely agree with you and to answer dr jack's question is the fact that people who come from lower socioeconomic classes or who have difficulty in understanding maybe it would be okay and we have done we have continued with oral anticoagulation but in people who understand what we can offer them and switch because low molecular weight heparin is expensive as well and uh, they find it uh, difficult to continue with an injection twice a day or or, or whatever so, uh, so uh, we do switch them onto uh, uh, this uh, according to this chart. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amber. I just wanted to make a concluding remark that current uh, American College of Cardiology guidelines clearly says that those patients who, who fall in the M uh, WHO category code, they should not go for pregnancy. And as you clearly said that those who are with pulmonary hypertension, as in Miller syndrome, and there are four or five other entities. And if they get pregnant at any point, we should develop a culture of counseling them to terminate the pregnancy because it's not only the risk for uh, the mother, uh, for the child, but for the mother as well. Uh, so those uh, participants, like one, uh, 70 participants who are or doctors who are with us in today's discussion, uh, I would like uh, uh, to take this home that those patients who fall in WHO category four for the pregnancy should not go for the pregnancy. And by any chance, if they get pregnant, they should see the doctor and terminate the pregnancy. That's what the guidelines say and all the experts today we have, they, uh, they agree with the consensus. So before, uh, no, before- uh, can, I, can I just uh, ask a question from Dr. Amber because she practices a lot in Lahore. Uh, you have uh, patients who have uh, heart diseases and then they become pregnant. Are you routinely trying to do fetal echo in these patients who are high risk so as to identify the fetal abnormalities in these patients who have congenital heart diseases, who have cardiomyopathies, who have valvular heart disease, so that when they are delivered, there is a neonatologist around who can then manage them properly? I think that's an excellent question. As uh, I said earlier, I mean, I don't see a huge number of patients who are, you know, I don't do a specifically cardio obstetric practice to see a large number of patients. If I do come across them, I may have suggested to them to get fetal echoes in the last five years, not before that, because fetal echo was not that well developed. And now our pediatric departments are beginning to do them, and particularly if they have congenital heart disease themselves, or uh, but uh, not, not for rheumatic heart disease, and uh, uh, not uh, for valves replaced for rheumatic heart uh, disease. Dr. Amber, but as far as I understand, do we have any current guidelines for fetal echo in the pregnancy? Uh, not that I know. No, no we, we, the, the, there are guidelines. There are, there are guidelines, guidelines for fetal echo. Heart, and, and I think if Dr. Amber remembers, there was a, there, a cardiac surgeon, a colonel, I forget his name right now, uh, when you were having the first, one of the first uh, conferences in Lahore, and I had presented a data on fetal echocardiography. I think that was about 15 years back. And uh, in Federal Government Services Hospital, Islamabad, we were routinely, uh, in conjunction with the uh, obstetricians, doing uh, a fetal echocardiography in the high-risk patients. And that data has been published also. And I think that uh, what you said just now, a cardio obstetrics, this should also become a speciality now because you have more congenital heart disease patients who have been operated, who are getting pregnant, even if the rheumatic heart disease reduces, the congenital heart disease individuals are going to increase because more of them are getting uh, uh, operated of, uh, and are living into adult life. 
So I think this will become another speciality where in the heart team, you need to have a cardiologist and obstetrician and gynecologist, and you need to have a neonatologist there. So all these services, I think, would be needed in the future so that you can actually manage these pregnancies better and uh, able to deliver them better also. In, uh, can I say something, Dr. Amber? Can I, can I add something to this, Dr. Amber? And Dr. Shahbaz Quresh. Uh, the NICE guidelines, which were updated in 2014, uh, they say that uh, cardiac uh, anomaly scan including echocardiography should be done around 20 to 22 or two weeks of gestation and if an outflow tract obstruction is suspected then another cardiac scan should be done around 24 weeks of gestation so this is absolutely. what we usually practice absolutely uh, this is something that is beginning to happen also in uh, i mean if we talk about local practice we have some people who are doing fetal echoes and uh, the hospital uh, in Lahore is uh, doing a lot of fetal echoes as well. Cardio obstetrics, Dr. Shabazz, is a specialty. There is a big conference coming up in September on cardio, obstruct uh, cardio obstetrics and there are people who are taking a lot of interest. This is a huge specialty uh, uh, from the West, congenital heart disease and from the East and from the developing countries is more with a rheumatic heart disease, but congenital heart disease is also picking up uh, and cured congenital heart disease. We have so many patients who have uh, uh, repaired uh, lesions. So we you, will be- You know something that Magdi, Magdi Yaqub, even uh, they have also done a percutaneous uh, valvuloplasty in, uh, in the, pre in the uh, fetal stage by uh, going from the abdomen of the mother and then opening up the valve there if it was a severe aortic stenosis which had been diagnosed. And this is sometimes Absolutely. way back in the early 90s. So I think uh, that it has evolved over a uh, period of time and the guidelines have very, very rightly accepted fetal echocardiography to be a part of. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry for Hello, our Dr. Asma. I would like to take the next speaker. Yes, Harun. Yes, Dr. Amar, it was a very nice and comprehensive presentation which we went through and uh, I think you had had a great preparation for that. We have learned a lot of uh, new things, but one thing which I would like to add in or would like to consult with you is that we usually come across patients with, you know, tight mitral stenosis during pregnancy. And uh, in the latter part of the pregnancy, say after a, a third uh, after the third month, we can go. The patient can go through PTMC, and we have been doing this. And so, yeah. what is your opinion, and what is the rate uh, you are doing these procedures during pregnancy in your center? Uh, Dr. Harun, I intentionally did not because there is another talk on management, which is why I did not uh, talk about management in my talk. Uh, uh, so there will be a talk, but if just out of yes, but that, that's it, by the uh, way, I just wanted yeah, 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 to know. Yeah, yeah, your, your, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, my experience with PTMC was massive uh, when I used to work at Mayo Hospital or at Gulab Devi, where we were dealing with lower socioeconomic classes. And every month we would do at least one or two pregnant ladies and we would prefer to do them in uh, during the second trimester because that's where they are the best in the third trimester oh, the yeah. nerves are very soft and you your chances of getting mitral regurgitation are quite high because you tend to inflate and but we have dealt with very sick patients even uh, having done them when they're sitting vertically up with severe pulmonary edema and with uh, very good results uh, getting them through pregnancies after that so uh, that's we, a big relief yeah. The big relief you bring the patient. You, it, 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 it is like a life-saving procedure, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, and when done uh, in expert hands, it's a it, it's a really good problem solving for them because you don't want to send them for surgery. I mean, you don't send people for sure, surgery sure. with uh, pliable mitral valves, basically in this day. Yeah. And age. Yeah. 
so so it, it is done quite a lot uh, uh, when when indicated and as uh, dr ishtiak said earlier we are beginning to do them more and more with pulmonary hypertension when we find them with pulmonary hypertension we will bring them on to the table earlier sure. we don't tend to do them in the first trimester but second trimester definitely one wants to do them if they present yeah, in the yes, third usually you, you usually we do it in the second trimester and it is our routine it is our routine absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. in the third Thank trimester you. you're a bit Thank slow you. but you do them for symptoms for symptomatic patients sure. still do yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. uh, thank you, Dr. Amber. I request all the panelists and all the people who are listening to us uh, right now to hold on and write the question with you. We have a separate question answer uh, session uh, so that we uh, we remain in the timeline and continue uh, listing all the speakers. So, right? Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, input. And uh, now, uh, next on board, we have Dr. Sabine. Uh, Masood and she is head of department of Gynae and Ops at Ishma University, Karachi. And she has got a very interesting topic to talk on today. Uh, and uh, we are very fascinated uh, to listen to her. And the topic she will be talking today will be how long a women with a cardiac diseases can be with you. Uh, Dr. Sabi, welcome on board. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Over to you. अच्छा बताएं Dr. Yes, I'm trying to change. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm trying to change the slides. Uh, have I shared the screen myself or you people have shared it? No, no. You have to. It's the first I'm slide sure. that women are precious, right? But how come? Yes, Dr. Sabine, we can see. You can see the slides. Okay. Yes. So, Uh, thank you very much uh, to all the organizers, especially Professor Akalda, Sundro, Gets Pharma, and all um, uh, our panelists and all our participants to be here and to listen to this uh, very important talk. Uh, it was good sharing the previous two talks, uh, and I think uh, my talk was uh, is more directed towards the postgraduates, towards the family physicians, and uh, uh, towards the doctors who are practicing uh, medicine. And uh, just uh, a very simple, straightforward, small, small talk, uh, not loaded with uh, too many uh, too many studies. So I intentionally did that. And the question is that how long the women with heart disease continue to reproduce, and are there enough contraceptive choices for women with uh, heart disease? So as we all know, that women are precious. Their own well-being and health of their progeny decide the future health of the generations. And intergenerational transmission of disease, as we just said, congenital heart disease, they are transmitted to the newborn, to the unborn, and that can be an intergenerational transmission. So we know that a bad start lasts a lifetime. So the question is that how long should a woman continue to reproduce? And if she is especially with heart disease, so the answer is till women in the womb concept persist. Till she's alive, she'll continue to reproduce, no matter what you say, what she's, what she's suffering from. Because the reproduction and the reproductive processes, they all consider that the woman is there to reproduce. The moment she stops reproducing, she will probably not be a woman. And this concept instead, in spite of so many things, still persists. So the, another question is that is creation of human being not a project? Before we embark on any project, we plan, 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 and then execute. But our woman, she enters a pregnancy, she embarks upon it, uh, this important project of new life, ill-informed, ill-prepared, 
and without planning. And we just had a, an example of a woman who is our staff member. She had Bershiari syndrome, another one with mitral regurgitation, a uh, severe degree of mitral regurgitation. And she was advised against the pregnancy, but she said that if she would not reproduce, she'll not be considered as a woman in the, uh, in the family. So she has to reproduce. So with this scenario, now I'm talking about the contraceptions. That what contraceptions should be offered and how they should be offered. So we all know the types of contraceptions. They can be calendar method, pills, injections, uh, subdermal implants, and then these uh, estrogen patches, vaginal diaphragms and condoms, and tubal ligation, and in males, condoms and uh, vasectomy. We know about all these, but how many of us understand that contraception is a delicate and difficult issue, which carries ethical and moral dilemmas. So it's not easier to ask a woman to do a contraception if she's suffering from cardiac disease, because then again, the woman and womb concept will uh, pop in. Unless we are, um, we are strong enough, if we know the communication skills, if we can delegate the issue of contraception to the woman, then probably we may be successful. Few obstetricians and unfortunately few cardiologists have practical knowledge, skill of interactions towards complex heart disease, pregnancy and contraception. Because if we are obstetrician, then we will go for these two, pregnancy and contraception. But if one happens to be a cardiologist, would dwell towards more towards the heart disease and refer the patient or the woman to pregnancy uh, to obstetrician. And obstetrician will only take care of pregnancy and contraception or antenatal care, postnatal care. And after the delivery, she'll say that, okay, go for, uh, uh, go for contraception. So we need to have a holistic approach in order to address the issue. Now, because of the poor provision of family planning and pre-pregnancy advice to our young women who are entering the pregnancy and lack of specialized service for women with heart disease, uh, there is a lack of counseling, and contraception counseling, as we all know, should begin early because of the congenital heart diseases, as we just discussed very nicely. And the choice of the method should, base, should be based on the impact of an unplanned pregnancy. What will happen if a woman enters the pregnancy with a, uh, with a pulmonary hypertension? The risk and benefits of the contraceptive types and individual preferences. So there are uh, knowing doing gaps. What is the problem? Uh, lack of published data. There's not the, as much data as we expect that to be there about, about contraception and women with heart disease. Then family planning physicians may be overcautious, denying women appropriate contraception, which leads to unplanned pregnancy. And then cardiologists may be unaware of the range of effective and safe contraceptive methods. I'm not talking of specialist cardiologists, but those who who have just uh, training cardiologists or who have just entered into the cardiac practice. So the women with the highest risk lesions may not have access to effective contraception and may have unintended high-risk pregnancies. Then at the other end of the spectrum, women who choose cardiac risk associated with pregnancy, uh, whose cardiac risk associated with pregnancy is low, they have been advised to undergo termination and sterilization. So we have extremes of uh, two situations. Now, this is very important slide, which says failure rates of different contraceptives. I would not go into very much detail of it, but just see that barrier method of contraception has a high, high failure rate. And we do not afford uh, to have this method in women who embark upon the pregnancy with cardiac disease and with severe cardiac disease of grade three or four. So, while as uh, combined contraceptive pills, which have estrogen and progesterone, they have a very uh, high, uh, low failure rate if the use is perfect. Similar is true for the desogestral uh, uh, contraceptive uh, pills. And Myrina, intrauterine contraceptive device, Implanon, we'll be talking a little bit about all these. They have as good um, a success rate as that of female or male sterilization. So uh, we have to remember that barrier method of contraception is 
not good, good enough for the women uh, who embark uh, upon pregnancy with cardiac disease. So I just quoted, there are a number, a few studies, not a number of them, a few studies which address contraceptive knowledge and practices among females who presented with cardiac disease. And this study was published in Lahore very lately. And just want to go very quickly over it, that uh, it, the spectrum of cardiac disease in this study was valvular heart, valvular heart disease, ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathy, congenital and post-surgical valve replacement. The important thing I wanted to highlight from this study was that barrier method of contraception was used by a majority of the women, more than 37%. While implant, that is subdermal implant, was used only by 1% of the women, which is the most successful uh, method of contraception was used by only 1% of the women. And uh, almost 48% of the uh, women had more than three children. You can see para three, para four, 26 and 21%. And the knowledge of contraception, almost 77% of the women with cardiac disease had no or partial knowledge of contraception. And this, this pattern was reflected in so many other studies which were, uh, we did not belong to Pakistan, but the pattern was more or less the same. So what contraception choices choices are available and applicable to women with heart disease in their reproductive years? So there are five major uh, contraceptive choices available. Barrier method, estrogen-containing contraceptives, progesterone-based -based contraceptives, intrauterine contraceptive devices, and finally, uh, sterilization, both female and male. Out of all these, Progesterone-based contraceptives and intrauterine contraceptive devices against what we usually believe and what uh, our uh, cardiac friends usually believe are intrauterine contraceptive devices, if used appropriately, are the most important uh, contraceptive, uh, is the most important contraceptive method for a woman who enters the pregnancy with cardiac disease. So barrier method, as you know, is user dependency, uh, has user dependency and it's not ideal for women in whom a pregnancy must be avoided. Though it has no cardiac uh, contraindications. As far as oral contraceptive pills are concerned, they contain estrogen and progesterone. So there are two types of them. One has both estrogen and progesterone hormones. They are most effective ones, but because of this estrogen component, uh, it cannot be given to women suffering from uh, severe heart disease. And another one is a low dose of progesterone, that is low dose pill or mini pill. Now, combined oral contraceptive pills, which has estrogen and progesterone component in it, especially the estrogen, uh, the, they are pills, they are patches, they are rings and injectables. They are all contraindicated in women with a history of thrombosis unoperated atrial septal defects with right to life shunt and especially the cyanotic heart disease. Obviously a mechanical heart valve, content operation, pulmonary hypertension and coronary artery disease and atrial and uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, despite appropriate anticoagulation, these oral combined pills containing estrogen and progesterone are generally contraindicated in women suffering from heart disease. What if a woman is already on warfarin and requests contraceptive pills? Because we know that contraceptive pills are bas basic main contraindication of contraceptive pills is their thrombogenity, thrombogenic, uh, uh, thrombogenic uh, potential. So uh, a woman says that she is already taking warfarin in whatever dose, five milligrams or more than that. So can she uh, use uh, contraceptive pills? So anticoagulants with warfarin does not provide complete protection against the thrombotic effects of estrogen. So generally, again, COC combined pills are not indicated. Estrogen and progesterones affect the metabolism of warfarin. So the frequency of INR monitoring should be increased when starting any hormonal contraception. If at all, if a woman is suffering from mild cardiac disease, grade one, then she may uh, have OC pills because they are more effective and less failure, with less failure rate. But in that case, INR monitoring uh, needs to be increased. Now, oral progesterone preparations, as I said, that progesterone and as, is, uh, as the evidence is there, that progesterone preparations 
oral preparations uh, and injectables, they are safe to be used in women with cardiac disease. But uh, the question is that all or do all uh, progesterone preparations uh, have same safety profile? So we have progesterone only mini pills, new progesterone only pills, which has which has got desogesterone in it, and emergency contraceptive pills, pills which has levonorgestrel in it. So uh, progesterone only pills, uh, uh, though has no cardiac contraindication to use, but it is uh, and it is not significantly thrombogenic as well as far as contraceptive doses are concerned. But they are not generally recommended for those with major heart disease because the risk, uh, because there is a high risk of uh, relatively poor efficacy. The failure rate is higher in progesterone only pills, and we do not afford a woman with pulmonary hypertension to get pregnant. So this is not an ideal uh, drug to be given to a woman whom we want absolute contraindication, absolute contraception. Now, now comes emergency contraception. There are two of them. So emergency contraception can be used up to five days after unprotected sex, a burst condom, or a miss pills. So uh, they are that uh, they are level not just based compounds, and they can be safely used. But more important is the copper containing intrauterine contraceptive devices. And they are most effective method of contraception and will prevent 99% of pregnancies. And they can be used within five days of unprotected coitus. So an antibiotic cover has to be uh, uh, considered because of uh, if the woman is suffering from cardiac disease as well. Otherwise, in, uh, in non-cardiac cases, we don't give antibiotics, generally speaking. But then these women can continue with this intrauterine contraceptive device if he wants to continue it with it uh, later, or that can be removed after the first, uh, after she has the menstruation. Now, long-acting progesterone preparations are depo uh, uh, injections, that is depo provera, intrauterine systems, Mirena, which is very, very effective, and subdermal uh, sub implants by the name of Implanon. So uh, as far as uh, this depo provera is concerned, it has 50 milligrams per ml, and there are no cardiac indi contraindications to this highly effective contraceptive method. And it, its continued efficacy is dependent on regular 12 weekly deep intramuscular injections, since there may be rapid return to fertility. But uh, theoretically speaking, uh, we are just yet to see many uh, women developing hematoma at the site of injection. And this is a risk uh, in patients who are taking anticoagulation, uh, uh, anticoagulant drugs, especially warfarin. So this is the more of a theoretical risk rather than a practical risk, but this is a, a highly effective contraceptive method. Another very effective uh, and safest is Implanon. Uh, the pregnancy rate is less than one per thousand years. And it is, um, it is uh, the duration of uh, contraception, contraceptive effect is three years. And this is a small implant uh, which is inserted under the skin of the upper arm. And it delivers a continuous dose of hormone, etonorgestrel, which is a progesterone and is a safe uh, is safe hormone as far as pregnancy is concerned. Now, Myrina, this is again um, uh, a very important uh, intrauterine contraceptive device for women with cardiac disease. It has levonorgestrel uh, as, a, as a hormone uh, loaded into it, but the release of levonorgestrel is local and only 0.3 milligrams is released uh, in the intrauterine system. In the intrauterine, uh, system. The cardiovascular risk of um, intrauterine uh, contraceptive devices is, is confined at the time of insertion, in particular to the instrumentation of the cervix. When cervix is hold uh, with the volslum, uh, it is this procedure is, may be associated with a vasovagal reaction in 5% of the women, so which may cause potentially fatal cardiovascular collapse especially in, in those with an fontan circulation or pulmonary vascular disease. So, otherwise this is very safe. So the risk, how can we reduce this risk of vasovagal uh, syncope in women with cardiac disease? 
So this can be reduced by the use of a paracervical block or a combined spinal and epidural uh, block. But paracervical block is good enough in these women. And antibiotic prophylaxis, obviously, in women with cardiac disease are given. Otherwise, we don't recommend. So intrauterine system is not recommended for women with fontan circulation or pulmonary vascular disease. But this is not an absolute contraindication. In this case, if implanon is used, uh, the, the subdermal implant, that is better. But uh, if we can take care of this vasovagal thing, vasovagal reaction, then it is safe to be used even in women with pulmonary vascular disease as well. So there are three types of uh, intrauterine contraceptive devices which, is, which are available in Pakistan. First is the Myrina, which we just discussed. And uh, it's very reliable. Second is the copper tea, which has copper loaded in it. And the third one is multi-load. It's same as copper tea, but has less surface area and causes less menstrual uh, dysmenorrhea and uh, is very effective and safe to be used in uh, pregnant women. One very important uh, 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 information is about this bosentan and uh, hormonal uh, contraception. This endothelial antagonist, Bosentan, is used in the treatment of pulmonary hypertension and at times dyspnea. So it is an enzyme inducer and significantly reduces the efficacy of some of the hormonal preparations, including these um, uh, kerosate or a desodestral preparation, which is a progesterone one, and uh, the implants that we use. So additional protection may be needed in women whom we do not want to get pregnant uh, with a severe cardiac disease. Finally, we come to the sterilization. And bilateral tubal ligation seems to the cardiologist to be the logical choice of contraception in patients in whom pregnancy may be life-threatening. But this uh, um, advice for bilateral tubal ligation should be given uh, very cautiously because this is not the panacea for all ills. The woman is suffer may be suffering from menorrhagia, heavy menstrual blood loss, uh, uh, and in that case, if you do a bilateral tubal ligation, the problem is likely to persist in these patients in whom who think that their family is complete. The, it is better to give progesterone-based uh, contraceptive uh, uh, contraception like uh, Myrina or like subdermal implants because they are going to take care of their heavy menstrual blood loss, which may be caused because of anticoagulants that are given to the women. And then it has major psychological impact. The woman thinks that she is no more able to reproduce. And you know that a woman in womb uh, concept, which I said earlier, is, a, is the most important concept we must take care of. And procedure itself may carry a significant risk to women for whom pregnancy may be the highest risk with cardiac disease. Another one is the laparoscopic tubal ligation. So if one has to decide for sterilization, then laparoscopic tubal ligation in women with cardiac disease may carry risk to, the, to her cardiac uh, problems, like insufflation of abdomen with carbon dioxide, intermittent head tilt down, and positive pressure ventilation. They can reduce cardiac output and may be poorly tolerated in the woman with pulmonary vascular disease. Besides, the risk of air embolism may be paradoxical in those with right to left shunt. So you need, you know, uh, uh, at times these trendylen back positions, women has to put in acute trendylen back position, and this may not be good for her uh, cardiac reserves. So if tubal ligation has at all to be performed, it should better be performed with mini laparotomy. Combined spinal or epidural anesthesia would be the safest uh, to do in, this, in these women. As far as vasectomy is concerned, obviously, if the woman is suffering from cardiac disease, uh, the male partner, if it's sterilized, uh, can limit the family size. But uh, the another thing which needs to be considered is that male partner may outlive his female partner who has heart disease and may wish to have a family with a new partner. So vasectomy has to be uh, thought twice or thrice before advising for this particular uh, uh, family planning method. Now, uh, coming to the end of the presentation, what are the contraceptive advice in women with specific cardiac lesions? So uh, in a nutshell, 
as I said earlier, that progesterone only methods. The long acting reversible contraceptives like Implanon and intrauterine contraceptive devices, uh, Mirena, that is levonorgestrel, uh, which has levonorgestrel loaded in it, are therefore the method of choice in women with specific cardiac diseases. And by specific cardiac diseases, as we knew from uh, the previous uh, learned um, speakers, that peripartum, peripartum cardiomyopathy, uh, especially in these women, uh, the occurrence of heart failure has been reported even after termination of pregnancy and or stillbirth. So further supporting the need for reliable contraception to prevent unplanned pregnancy. And women with reduced ejection fraction, those uh, who have less than 45 uh, percent, uh, they are considered as high risk as has just been enumerated. And those with the WHO class four with less than 30 percent um, left ventricular ejection fraction, they should be given a contraceptive method which has a relatively a less failure rate. And again, Implanon or intrauterine contraceptive device, Mirena, uh, is are the treatment of are the treat, are the contraceptives of choice. Uh, the women on warfarin or atrial flutter of fibrillation, uh, caution with OCPs is required. Though now OCPs have got very uh, little uh, estrogen in it, and they are uh, relatively safer, but still the the choice has to be made. Uh, in consultation with the cardiac uh, uh, cardiac friends and uh, informed consent should be given to the woman. And uh, especially women with mechanical wells, pulmonary hypertension, they are the highest uh, risk. Uh, they are the women who have the highest risk of pregnancy and for whom extremely effective contraception is most important. So barrier methods, uh, natural methods and calendar methods, they should be uh, these should be discouraged uh, to be used by these women. So in conclusion, for women with heart disease, pregnancy may be life-threatening and there is a safe and effective method of contraception for each condition. And obstetricians and cardiologists need to understand the risk of pregnancy in women with heart disease, appreciate the need to refer high-risk women for specialist pre-pregnancy counseling and antenatal care and offer appropriate contraceptive advice. And do not wait for women to come back after six weeks postpartum, because uh, many of the studies have shown that women do not attend uh, the pre-pregnancy clinic, they never attend, or they hardly ever attend the, uh, the postpartum six weeks uh, clinic. So the pre-pregnancy clinic or during pregnancy uh, is, the, is the golden time where the opportunity should be availed. So in the end, we all have to learn to unlearn. The illiterate of this is uh, Elvin Toffler, uh, an American physicist uh, and uh, futurist. And he says, the illiterate of 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So thank you very much. I'm again very much thankful to the cardiac, uh, to Dr. Professor um, Khalda Sumro and um, uh, Getz Pharma and all our worthy speakers and our participants who gave me this opportunity and listened to me. And I think I have, I, I have been able to uh, give my message across. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sabine, for such a fantastic uh, talk. And uh, 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 obviously, uh, uh, contraception uh, in a patient with cardiac disease is a big challenge. And uh, you correctly summarize and give a point in the nutshell that what uh, exactly we have to do. Before uh, uh, moving uh, to any question answers, I would uh, immediately want to take the, uh, our next speaker on board. So we remain in time and then we can come up with a question answer session. So the next speaker for, uh, and uh, uh, for today uh, would doctor would be Dr. Shwebun Nissa and she's an associate professor uh, of uh, gynae and ops in Ghulam Muhammad Medical College, Sakhar. And she will present and today she's going to talk about basically about the management of the pregnancy and heart diseases. So up till now we've discussed the incidence 
the, the screening, and then we talk about the contraception, and now we are going to talk about the management. Uh, Dr. Shwebhanis, are you with us? Can you hear me? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, can you hear me, talk, uh, Doctor? Yes, Bye. yes. Uh, we can hear you now. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I'm Doctor Shwebhanis Sumro, Associate Professor at Glam Mahmud Maher Medical College. Can you see the slide? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Uh, can, can you go to the complete screen? Uh, yes. Can you see now? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rambar. I'm Dr. Shrebnissa Sumro, Associate Professor from Glam Mahmud Mahar Medical College. Uh, I'm very thankful for, for the Pakistan Cardiac Society and Professor Khalda for giving me an opportunity to discuss among these galaxy of the speakers. Thank you, Dr. Khalda. I'm here to discuss about the management of the cardiac disease in pregnancy and overview. So this incidence is uh, already discussed just in a quick review. It is it was 0.23% throughout the world. In developing countries like our country's rheumatic heart disease is still discussed is more common in our society. While in developed countries, the uh, congenital heart disease is more common. Uh, in past 15 years, studies which shows that the peripartum cardiomyopathy predominantly is the most important cause for the maternal death. These are the certain hemodynamic changes which occur during pregnancy and these can be sustained by the normal pregnancy but once the patient is having the uh, decrease or reduced myocardial uh, uh, functions, they are unable to cop these changes in that the plasma volume is increased as well as cardiac output is raised, the heart rate is increased which is at about 10 to 20 beats per minute by the second trimester. And these changes more prominently occur by the second trimester, particularly at the 28 to 32 weeks of gestation. The things which are unchanged is the, uh, is the, uh, 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 the systemic vascular resistance which is reduced while the pulmonary vascular resistance is reduced, but the plasma opotic pressure which is, is not reduced and these gradient which is, kept the patient in vulnerable for the production, vulnerable for the development of the pulmonary edema. These women with underlying cardiac disease may not always accommodate the hemodynamic changes occurring during pregnancy and may develop the ventricular dysfunction. These women should be fully assessed by the obstetrician and the cardiologist, particularly especially the preconception. The maternal risk and the fetal risk should be explained. A plan should be optimized regarding medication should be made and the surgical correction for particularly for the structural defect are there should be corrected before the pregnancy. These are the certain critical changes which occur during the pregnancy. These changes, hemodynamic changes occur by the fifth week of the gestation and these are symptoms begins by the 12 to 16 weeks of the gestation. These changes peak after the end of the second trimester at about 28 to 30 weeks when the demand of the oxygen supply and these uh, correlate with the product of the conception is increased. And again, the critical period is during labor and delivery because of the contraction of the uterus and the bearing down effects during labor which produce stress over the mother and the stress over the uh, cardiac stress and other critical period is immediately after delivery. When the baby is delivered, there the pressure over the greater vessels is released and the blood, blood from, the, the, uh, uh, from the obstruction, which uh, at about 800 to 1000 ml is entered in the circulation, which produce great burden over the heart and can lead to patient vulnerable for the certain uh, heart, uh, heart failure or increased preload. Another critical period is the four to five days after delivery. 
because the systemic vascular resistance is reduced and if patient is confined to the bed and he is immobilized there is an increased risk of the thrombosis during that period so if the patient is well and it is not in the worst condition she should be encouraged to mobilize during these period these are the certain changes which mimic the cardiac disease some are still uh, discussed previously the symptoms which common are the breathlessness weakness edema and syncope and by clinical examination we pick out the tachycardia aspirating fast heart sound murmur typically the systolic murmur which are the common and mimicking the uh, cardiac disease in the pregnancy and the bruy over the chest displacement of the apex feet upward toward the left these are the normal finding these are the particular symptoms of the heart disease as the progressive dyspnea or arthropenia nocturnal cough syncope chest pain and hemoptysis these are the certain clinical findings these are also discussed but i am just quick review stenosis clubbing of fingers and the distension of the neck pain systolic murmur with uh, which are the not common in the normal pregnancy and the cardiomegaly these are the particular related to the heart diseases investigation is already discussed ecg echocardiography is a important and allow the echo accurate diagnosis of the most heart disease particularly the structural anomalies and as well as the function of the heart and the chest x ray is not contraindicated in the pregnancy it can be done with a proper sheet and then which can detect the anomalies if the patient is having the failure or cardiomyopathy or the pulmonary congestion in these things we are we cannot hold the chest x ray mri and ct scan or can be done or safe in the pregnancy routine examination with electrophysiological studies that are normally postponed until after pregnancy but angiography can be carried out when required in case of with the patient having the acute coronary syndrome then angiography can be carried out this is the near classification so, so the all the cardiologists are sitting here are well aware about this uh, classification so just skipping this slide this is the important slide which shows the classification of the heart disease during pregnancy according to the risk the low risk as the ast pst pgn ms mild mild ms and the corrected f uh, pilot cytology having the risk at about 0 to 1 person medium risk with 15 by to 15 person with moderate to severe ms ms with atrial fibrillation as an uncorrected pilot cytology high risk with a rate of up to the 50 person those with a pulmonary hypertension as a mentis syndrome aortic cavitation and valvular involvement and marfan syndrome when it's dilated more than the 4.5 it's there is a great risk and can lead to the mortality up to 50 person these are the certain predictor factors which predict the uh, uh, predict the cardiac complication can occur during pregnancy if there is a history of heart failure ischemia or stroke arrhythmias baseline near classification of more than 2 mitral veil area more than, less than the 2 cm square and aortic veil area less than 1.5 cm and the ejection fraction is less than the 40 it is the cardiac event risk is 5% whenever there is a no predictor risk factor but it is raised at about 37% when there is a one predictor risk factor and this further rise up to 75% if the, there is more than one predictive risk factor is there these are additional risk factors as the anemia infection hypertension which are more prevalent in our society is still the physical labor our, our women who are working in the household work are in even in they are working in the field they are having the additional burden or the workload on their heart another are the weight gain multiple pregnancy and other substance abuse these are the some effects of the pregnancy on the heart disease which are the worsening cardiac status congestive cardiac failure bacteria and the endocarditis which is particularly associated with the congenital malformation and the pulmonary edema venous thromboembolism and pulmonary embolism and rupture of aneurysm 
fetal risk of the maternal cardiac disease is more predominantly the miscarriages, maternal cyanosis or fetal hypoxia, and intrauterine fetal demise and intrauterine growth restriction is a more important. And the risk of the congenital heart disease, those is increased. It is generally is at about five percent. But the risk of congenital disease, if the, either of the parent is affected, is it is at about three to four percent. If mother is affected, the risk is raised up to the six to ten percent, and it is a diff six to ten percent. If the uh, uh, mother is raised, uh, mother is having the uh, congenital heart defect, and can you hear me? Okay, the congenital yes, heart disease. Okay, thank you. Regarding the management, how we will get the favorable outcome? It is depend upon once we have the high index of the suspicious. We have the suspicious that the patient is having the uh, cardiac disease, uh, the some underlying cardiac defects, which leading us to the prompt diagnosis. And with this diagnosis, we will produce the uh, timely intervention. And this will lead us to the teamwork, which include the multidisciplinary treatment, including the obstetrician, cardiologist, neonatologist, pain management team, anesthetist and anesthetist and the neonatologist and the dedicated nursing staff. For these combined management, we will get the favorable maternal as well as fetal outcome. This is a layout. We will go for the management. We start from the pre-pregnancy, which is very well discussed previously, and we will go through for the antenatal management and therapeutic termination of the pregnancy, management of the labor during uh, management, during labor delivery, including the all stages from the first to third, third stage of the labor, and particularly the management during perpurum. This is uh, pre-pregnancy counseling is discussed earlier. Just a quick review. The, we have to counsel the mother before the marking on the pregnancy. What are the effects of the pregnancy and underlying cardiac disease? Need of frequent hospital attendance and the possible multiple admission is there. Risk of the fetus developing congenital heart disease. Risk of preterm labor and intrauterine growth restriction. There is the intensive maternal and the fetal monitoring during labor. Possible reduction of the maternal life expectancy, risk of maternal death during pregnancy, labor, or even in the perpetual phase. Termination of the pregnancy is an option for a certain condition. The therapeutic termination of the pregnancy is absolutely indicated with the severe pulmonary hypertension. The patient, those who are having the idiopathic. Uh, Primary pul pulmonary hypertension can sustain the pregnancy, but those who are having the secondary and severe pulmonary hypertension cannot sustain the pregnancy. There is an increased risk of the mortality at about the 50%. With uh, adequate management, it can be reduced, but it is having the high mortality rate. Mortality rate. So it should be uh, considered to terminate the pregnancy with severe pulmonary hypertension, as in Menger syndrome. And in case of the dilated cardiomyopathy with the congenital heart disease and the Marfan syndrome with dilated aortic root, or root more than 4.5 and cyanotic congenital heart disease and with the severe aortic stenosis. These are the some relative indication in multi-parous women with grade 2 and with previous history of the failure can sustain the pregnancy with so it can be continued, but it's again a relative contraindication for the termination of the pregnancy. Again, depend when we going to terminate the pregnancy. Termination should be done earlier, less than 12 weeks of the gestation by a suction evocation and dilatation in evocation. After 12 weeks of gestation, we should be considered either to continue pregnancy, either to terminate pregnancy. But once the patient is having deteriorating cardiac function, the pregnancy should be terminated at any time when the patient is having the deteriorating uh, its cardiac function. The antenatal woman, the most women will remain well during this antenatal period and outpatient management is usually possible. It should be managed by experienced obstetrician and cardiologist. Clear counseling of the risk and prognosis should be done. Evaluate current cardiac status at the antenatal phase 
and the optimized medical and the surgical management assess on first the functional class of the heart disease at antenatal visit should be planned every two weeks up to the 30 weeks then weekly it can be changed or optimized according to the condition of the patient which can we can uh, uh, modulate it and change it we can frequently call her or delay her antenatal period according to the condition it should be individualized on each visit we go for this uh, go for the uh, we go for the uh, pulse rate blood pressure weight and should be monitored and symptoms should be assessed lung phase should be auscultated and the functional grade should be re-evaluated re on each visit an important thing treatment compliance should be assured in prenatal management the patient should be advised to reduce physical activity which affect reduce burden over the heart avoid mini or minimize the aggravating factor decrease salt intake in certain condition ensure adequate diet take iron and vitamin and calcium supplementation wherever needed in our society the patients are usually iron deficient prevalence of the iron deficiency is an anemia is it about 80 to 90 percent in our society particularly in the pakistan maintain proper hygiene and dental care to prevent infection sometimes these things are the miss because we are overburdened by the flow of the patient so we can miss these things during examination and during management but these small things are the very important and should not be missed and the prophylactic antibiotics should be given to the patient with structural heart defect to reduce the risk of the bacterial endocarditis anticoagulant is essential with congenital heart disease pulmonary hypertension those who are replaced heart well for thromboprophylaxis and those who are at the risk of the atrial fibrillation and in case of the valvular heart disease the anticoagulation is used previously we discussed about uh, in uh, one of the speaker discussed that the discuss about the use of the thromboprophylaxis the low molecular weight heparin can be used throughout pregnancy unfractionated heparin even can be used throughout pregnancy and to reduce the risk of the embryopathy in those who are already taking the warfarin from the 6 to 12 weeks and again it can be continuous at the time of the delivery or at 36 weeks in these schedules we can add the aspirin as with the dose of 75 to 100 milligram can be added and these anticoagulation should be continued and those the echocardiography should be done at booking and is again repeated depend upon the condition it again repeated at the 28 week of gestation serial ultrasound for the fetal growth mayor may fourth particularly the fortnightly or more frequently if required for growth and for the fetal surveillance fetal growth monitoring via doppler ultrasound via biophysical profile and the measurement of the physical measurement of the fundal height Anomaly skin should be done at the 18 to 20, 18 to 20 week of gestation. If we found any abnormality in the gray scale, the, any abnormality in the foreview of the cardiac chamber, we refer the patient for the echocardiography at 20 to 24 week for the specialized center for the congenital malformation. In those patients, the mother who are having the congenital disease or any sibling who is having, having the congenital disease so these patients are the at risk of the uh, development of the cardiac uh, congenital malformation so we are, have to refer these patients for the echocardiography at 20 to 24 week of gestation indication uh, of hi dr shweba can you help me yes yes can you ha having the problem no 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 problem i just wanted to give a time check that uh, because we are having uh, heavy rainfall and we are losing all the participants i would okay. appreciate if you can quickly come up to the ma management slides 
so we can wrap up uh, the session okay these are i'm uh, going quickly going through these slides these are the certain indication for the uh, okay thank you dr sanam uh, the elective admission should be done at the uh, two weeks before the expected date of the delivery and uh, it uh, with patient is having the nia class 2 at 28 to 30 week in case of the unfavorable surrounding and for nia class 3 in the four they should be admitted in whenever they are present the emergency admission is done whenever there is the deterioration of the functional rating or appearance of the complication of the pregnancy or deterioration sign and symptom of the cardiac function these are the key concern regarding the labor and delivery timing and mode of delivery should be decided reduction of effect of the tachycardia during labor is increased cardiac output in labor this should be reduced ensure the effective analgesia during labor anticoagulation is given whenever there is required endocarditis prophylaxis is given particular with a structural abnormality or those who are having the previously risk of the infective endocarditis spontaneous labor at term is the rule rather than there is a indication for cesarean section timing of the delivery is individualized according to the severity of the maternal disease and associated fetal compromises in cyanotic heart disease and significant iugr may need the preterm delivery and steroid in that condition of preterm delivery and the labor should be considered if there is a gestation age is less than 34 weeks and that case you have to admit patient patient for the monitoring because there is a risk of the development of the pulmonary edema the mode of delivery in cardiac patient general delivery is safe until and unless there is a indication for the cesarean section obstetrical as well as a cardiac indication of the cesarean section the cardiac indication of the cesarean section are the aortic root dilatation in case of the marfan syndrome and in the aortic dissection severe peripartum cardiomyopathy and severe left ventricular dysfunction coarctation of aorta with aortic rupture and associated anomaly with coarctation is aneurysmal aneurysm rupture and nia clause for the elective cesarean section may be considered for the battle control ventilation fluid management and the cardiac stress management during labor and delivery the institutional delivery is is the key the induction of the labor is reserved for those who are having the obstetrical indication and institution delivery is done where there is the uh, continuous 24 hour presence of the obstetrician and the cardiologist neonatologist facilities and the facilities of the cardioversion is there and the nearby facilities of the nicu and the icu facilities are there and the patient can be carried to the in case of the complication can carried to the coronary care unit these facilities are available this delivery should be done at date these area the induction of the labor can be done safely with the oxytocin and the prostaglandin fluid balance should be managed avoidance of the supine position in the labor and delivery which produce the supine position produce the uh, compression over the great vessel so this should be avoided continuous electrocardiogram monitoring and immersive pet monitoring is needed in a certain condition when particularly there is the pulmonary hypertension or the worsening signs of cardiac cardiac sign and symptoms in this condition we are go for the invasive monitoring continue fetal heart rate monitoring or intermittent fetal heart rate monitoring by the sonic kit or by the venar fetoscope or continue monitoring by the uh, ctg and the biophysical profile wherever is needed avoidance of the difficult instrumental delivery and the use of prophylactic antibiotic is recommended management during the first stage labor patient should be in the rest position and semi recumbent position we already discussed avoid the supine position give intermittent oxygen whenever needed particularly in the failure cases and in pulmonary hypertension the oxygen is raised at about 5 to 6 liter per minute and avoid maternal uh, mental and the physical stress give the proper analgesia in the form and anesthesia in the form of epidural and pethidine and the tramadol give oil fluid cautiously and in case of the heart failure and the pulmonary hypertension it should not be exceed more than 75 ml per hour except in the aortic stenosis and ventricular septal defect 
in the first stage anticoagulation should be stopped or whenever the patient thinks she is having the start of the labor these stop injecting the uh, anticoagulation or taking the anticoagulation uh, unfractionated low molecular weight heparin or even warfarin should be stopped before the 24 hour digitalization is considered in case of the congenital heart uh, in the case of the uh, congestive heart failure in fibrillation and into the cardiomyopathy and whenever there is respiratory rate is more than 24 and diuretic is considered whenever we suspect the pulmonary congestion or the pulmonary hypertension derifilin for the bronchospasm is considered and the endocarditis prophylaxis is given and beta blocker is considered when they were having the patient with a mitral stenosis and we are, can consider particular the beta 1 blocker is given as compared to beta 2 which can lead to the relaxation of the uterine muscle and having the problem during the labor. Endocarditis prophylaxis is rare but is a life threatening condition. Treatment is the same in general population with the emergency well if required. Antibiotic prophylaxis against infective endocarditis is generally not recommended for the childbirth except in a patient with previous history of infective endocarditis or cyanotic congenital heart disease. It is in the form of, you everyone know about this amoxicillin and dintamycin. The important thing is that it should be given at the onset of the labor or at the rupture of the membrane or if we are proceeding for the cesarean section, then it prophylactic, prophylactically can be given. In second stage, patient should be delivered with the proper position, avoiding the forceful bearing down Cardiovascular continuous cardiovascular electronic monitoring is continued there and adequate pain relief in the form of the epidural or the pudendal block, avoid spinal and the saddle block, keep the second stitch short by the use of the instrumental delivery, vacuum as well as the forcep, even we can use the vacuum in the convenient position. So with this instrumental delivery, we cut the second stitch short and we produce less pressure at the less efforts on the maternal heart. Third stage, it is the important stage and the as well as active management should be done to prevent the uh, uh, primary postpartum hemorrhage. This is further is important that in third stage when the baby is delivered, there is release in obstruction pressure, obstruction of the gravid uterus is released and there is a blood from the blood from this pressure uh, the volume is from at about 800 to 1000 ml entered in the circulation which produce great burden in the preload and th at this stage the patient is particularly susceptible to develop the pulmonary edema so we must be vigilant for the sign and the symptoms for these failure and this in this stage she should be in the proper position and if she did give the oxygen inhalation and diuretics can be uh, can be given when needed, and adequate analgesia is given. Watch for sign and symptoms of the congestive heart failure and the pulmonary edema. And we can safely treat the uh, PPH with by giving the mesoprostol in the form of parietally in prof prophylactic as well as the treatment form. And with restrict uh, restricted dose of infusion, we can give the syntrusinol but we avoid the erythromethrine, which can lead to the vasoconstriction. And we, if we are doing the caesarean section, we should avoid the manual removal of the placenta. And we can flash the wheel length press suture prophylactically instead of the using the using drugs can be given to prevent the uh, PPH. And management is important during the perforium. The close observation in first 24 to 72 hours if the patient is well and mobilized, it can be mobilized to prevent the, uh, prevent the risk of the thromboembolism. Go, go and look for the signs of the pulmonary congestion. And for anxiety related tachycardia, adequate rest and sedative if required can be given or prescribed in the first few days and mobilization should be done. Infection must be uh, treated in these phase. Breastfeeding should be advised. Patient on warfarin, as well as an heparin should be allowed to breastfeed because there is a very little amount of these drugs excreted in the breast milk. So these patients should be encouraged for breastfeeding. 
we give some advice at the time of discharge. Continue the treatment, avoid infection, reassessment after six weeks earlier if there is a complication, iron and folic acid supplementation, cardiological consultation for definitive management of the heart disease. Contraceptive are very much well discussed, so I'm skipping this slide. And very short and quick review, there's a conclusion. Pregnancy can be have the significant hemodynamic changes and impose an additional burden on the cardiac patient, especially around the time of the delivery and the labor and immediate in perpetual phases to achieve a successful pregnancy outcome, a clear understanding of these hemodynamic adoption as well as the meticulous maternal and the fetal surveillance for the risk of risk factors. Complication throughout the pregnancy is essential. Appropriate contraceptive and family planning advice as well as preconception counseling are most important. The concern effect efforts for the team consisting of a obstetrician, cardiologist, anesthetist, multidisciplinary is mandatory to ensure the optimal result. My take home message is that if the patient is having the cardiac disease, she should be uh, having the uh, proper checkup, she should be happy and uh, she should be mobilized and at least she take the uh, uh, walk at about 10, 10 nuts and the, she should check, on her, check her on the blood pressure and if either she is not diabetic, diabetic she must look for her blood sugar monitoring and in lost she should be happy for life given by God. She should be happy about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shebunisa. I understand that uh, a very long topic was given to you and it was very difficult to summarize. So, uh, so uh, now I would like to take a few questions from our participants. The first question, and I would, uh, I would I'll, uh, take the speaker's name so they can quickly address the questions, which are from the participants. So the first question is uh, from uh, Dr. Amber Malik, and our participant is asking that, uh, at what time, Dr. Gulam Murtaza is asking that when antenatal screening should start during the pregnancy? Antenatal Doc screening, as, as soon as patient is present to us for, for the cardiac disease, Antenatal screening for what? For cardiac diseases. If you antenatal, suspect disease, if when the antenatal is, screening? When the patient is come to us for, and we are uh, on history with the go that she is having, if she is already cardiac patient, then we know about she is cardiac. Then uh, uh, as soon as patient is uh, coming for the booking visit, we are go for the screening and it, if the patient is, uh, we are not known about, she is not a cardiac patient, we go for the th throughout the history and we suspect that she is in having the cardiac disease. At this time, we are, should start for the screening. Right. At the booking. Right. Doctor, Thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. Khaja, please uh, welcome Dr. Feroz Mehman, who is sitting here in a very smart... Yes, yes, yes. I was... <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, I would like. I was doing so, but I was uh, running short of time. I would uh, like to welcome Dr. Uh, Feroz Memon, who is the immediate ex president of Pakistan Cardiac Society, and he is a, a vice chancellor, uh, current vice chancellor of uh, Indus Medical College. So we are privileged yeah. to have. Him. Can I have a quick word? Yes, you sure, sir. After listening to these uh, superstars, uh, three speakers, and mega stars sitting as panelists, and a smart emerging star as a moderator, I think it was a wonderful session altogether. But I will just throw on one thing, which is all uh, treatment, management, everything is important, but more important is prevention and primary care that we should have, uh, we should approach the patient not to get pregnant. And for this, the patient is not important. It should be family counseling. The family yes. should be told because if we tell family, a patient not to get pregnant, she will have a very bad time in the family with her in-laws. So I think we should involve all the family and tell them that you have to take care of the patient or lady, whoever she is. She is very precious. Take care of her and she should maintain a healthy lifestyle without getting pregnant. This counseling is really essential. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, sir. Very, very exact point. We have already discussed this. Right. So the next question is, is for Dr. Sabine Nas. 
Dr. Sabin, uh, the question is that if a patient has gestational diabetes, would you like to manage the patient with the 70-30 uh, that is regular insulin? Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, the, uh, the question is about diabetes in pregnancy. So the yes. answer is that uh, women who are pregnant and who are diabetic better not to manage them with pre-mixed insulin because it is difficult uh, to, to manage uh, the glycemic status uh, at different times. So uh, the best thing is to uh, give it separately, insulin separate, insulin regular separate, and insulin NPH separate. Should not be mixed together. All right. The, another question popped up is that what antibiotic we should uh, give uh, before the copper IUCD, as you indicated in your presentation? Uh, what antibiotic? Okay. Yes. The antibiotic should be a broad spectrum antibiotic, uh, maybe uh, third generation if she is. Uh, she is high risk for cardiac disease, or maybe a simple uh, uh, penicillin-based antibiotic. So a broad spectrum one would do the job. Right. So this is the last question, and the question is from Dr. J. Andrew, and uh, he's asking that uh, if a patient come with a chest pain or suspected MI in the pregnancy, how to manage in, in 30 minutes? Anyone can answer. Anyone from panelists? Dr. Nusrat, would you like to answer this question? Unmute yourself. Uh, yes, Dr. Shahbaz, what was the question? Would you please repeat it? It is about the chest pain. How would you like to manage it? During pregnancy. During pregnancy. Yeah, of yes, it course. It is about not. the MI, basically, MI. If a patient uh, is expecting uh, the myocardial infarction uh, during... Normally, you will have about uh, three <laughs> times more common infarctions in patients who are pregnant. And therefore, how would you manage them? Thrombolytic therapy or PCI? Uh, which trimester of pregnancy? That is important. All right, let's say in the, 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 maybe in midterm. Midterm, I think uh, if hemodynamically she is stable, I would go for a BCI. All right, thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, would you like normally, to normally, what are, the, uh, I think let's discuss the, the causes of myocardial infarction in uh, women who are pregnant because they are different from the uh, uh, yeah. causes of infarction in patients who are not yeah. pregnant. Yes. Normally, it's like a spontaneous coronary dissection, which is very mm -hmm. common. And I remember Professor Khalda Sumro presenting some cases on, the, uh, on our forum also. So, and then atherosclerosis is much less. Thrombosis is there. And there is always something to, if, if somebody is in a place where you don't have the facility for a PCI, then probably thrombolytic therapy, and then you have to be careful as to what happens to the fetus also. So the unborn baby, that you, you have to look after that. I think, uh, Dr. Khalda, what would you say about it? Dr. Dr. Amber, how, how common is it to see uh, pregnant females having MI? Have you seen? I uh, maybe once in my uh, career, uh, and uh, but uh, I do see uh, 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 young women getting pregnant who have ischemic heart disease and they have atherosclerosis. Yeah. Uh, and I know them. That, I know them to have atherosclerosis. I have a patient who's had a bypass, and I went on to get her pregnant and then deliver the baby and everything. So uh, you know, she's had a bypass at the age of 28 or 29 mm -hmm. with advanced atherosclerosis, left main stem disease, and everything. But I think to answer the question, that what will you do with a patient with chest pain in 30 minutes and she's pregnant? I mean, the answer is, is relatively simple in the sense that you will do everything that you do for an acute MI patient if it is a stent. Yes. And what is the best thing to do? And that is to take them to the cath lab. Okay. Uh, and you take them to the cath lab and then you try and understand what is the mechanism of the disease which is causing the stemming. 
and which can be, as Dr. Shabazz said, and which I presented in my slides as well, can be either spontaneous coronary artery dissection, either it can be atherosclerosis, it can be thrombus, and it can be non-obstructive coronary artery disease, and there's laser spasm or some such thing. Sometimes you never know. And then, as he said, that you can be in a non-tertiary care setting or in a rural area where you just don't know what to do. So thrombolytic in a STEMI in a pregnant woman is not entirely contraindicated because the parent he doesn't come over. And, the, uh, and again, a very important is thing that if you are too near to delivery, uh, it becomes a bit of a conundrum that are you going to give them thrombolytic and then if they spontaneously deliver, if they're going to give them uh, so those are things to consider. But when you, once you do an angiogram, then you are you can you try and understand the pathophysiology behind it and treat it accordingly. Doctor um, yes. Amber, Doctor Amber, how would it, how would you think about a patient who has a spontaneous? Because you don't know what is the pathology inside, yeah, and if it know. is a spontaneous, if it's a spontaneous coronary dissection, and you give a thrombolytic therapy, you're going to have problems, don't you think yeah. so? Uh, that's right. But what will you do in a rural setting as you very right? Yes, that's the problem. That is the that, problem. That's the conundrum, right? That's the opinion of uh, Dr. Jack. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's, uh, uh, I thanks think that... for this. Is a very good question. I personally have seen and um, managed two patients with postpartum spontaneous coronary dissection one in the left main, one in the right coronary artery. The one in the mm -hmm. left main was breastfeeding. So I've not seen during pregnancy, it's always post-pregnancy in the lactating phase. And the one that had a severe left main dissection end up with stents, IVP, ultimately ECMO followed by an LVET device. And she decided not for a uh, transplant and she prefers the LVET device actually. Uh, so I, I would think that uh, one, I agree you should manage them as for AMI, but because it's so rare, we must be careful of AMI, STEMI mimics in this group, whether it's stress, cardiomyopathy, uh, acute PE, and of course, it's not a thrombotic lesion, but coronary dissection, which giving thrombolytics is very tenuous for both the mother as well as the fetus, which she's still pregnant or just uh, post-op. So I, I would be very hesitant for thrombolysis uh, in this group without clarifying the anatomy. So just to let people know, I think since this is COVID-19 period, also in the data coming out from Italy, if you look at uh, uh, cases that presented uh, with uh, STEMI in COVID-19, almost half the patient are STEMI mimics. Uh, so you, whether it's cardiomyopathy, yeah. myocarditis, or in situ thrombosis uh, rather than coronary artery disease, and half of them do not have any occlusive lesion. So I, again, I, I would probably be very wary of thrombolizing this group of patients. Uh, that's, that's my personal opinion. I'm not so experienced to have managed too many of these patients. So. I, I think you're absolutely right. And then in this uh, group of uh, patients, you also get some who have stress cardiomyopathy, the Takasubo's disease. And I think once again, there you would not be giving any thrombolytic therapy there because they would spontaneously dissolve. So perhaps, uh, the, the, right, maybe so the message, uh, message can be just you, you wait and hope for the best. Another thing which I would like to know is that what about the cardiac enzymes? Post, uh, suppose somebody is uh, being evaluated for an infarction just after delivery, the enzyme level of CKMP goes up as it is without an MI. So probably at, in that time, it is the troponin levels which you have to monitor. Uh, what are the thoughts of other panelists and the speakers? Let's have the opinion of Dr. Lopez from Philippine perspective. Yes, hello. I think we can rely on the troponin. Apart from the history, it has, it has to be a very good history. Because remember, many of these patients have a lot of symptoms. So we have to uh, complement the history with the troponin, with the ECG. Perhaps if you have an echocardiography, then you can do that. Look for wall motion abnormalities. Absolutely. But I agree that uh, we have to treat them as uh, ACS no matter what. But I'll have reservations with thrombolysis, as uh, the other panelists have mentioned. But with management, it's still as uh, AMI. All right. Uh, just a quick question. As all panelists are here, I just wanted to know that uh, PCI during the pregnancy, 
so initially it was uh, recommended that the BMS should be used, uh, but now the recent guideline update says that you can go with the DAS uh, and the DAPT, like clopidogrel, which is sort of thought to be uh, teratogenic, can now be continued during the pregnancy. So what is what are our current practices considering this? I think under the circumstances, if uh, it depends upon the, the size of the vessel also there, if it's a large sized vessel, which you are having, you can put in a bare metal stand. And uh, beyond that, uh, a drug eluting stands, uh, the newer generation of drug eluting stands probably would also be very recommended in these circumstances because you have to consider the long-term management. It is not just uh, for a couple of months that you're thinking about. You're thinking about a condition which is going to be lifelong then. Right. So for the, for the death interruption, uh, uh, whether I can make a quick please comment. Uh, please, uh, please. In terms of duration, I think uh, for the latest generation, there's no discrimination between DES and bare metal stand for shorting to one yes. month. But I would like yeah. to caution yeah. that for both stand type, if you do interrupt for delivery or surgery within two weeks to a month of the stand implantation, yes. there's a real risk yes, of stand is. thrombosis and death. So, so I, I would like to say that there are two options. One is that if you think that you need to deliver within a month, then try not to implant a stand. If you do need to, if you can extend beyond a month, I think it's relatively safe. If you do need to uh, reduce it to less than a month, Try not to stop both, continue with at least one agent uh, pre-op, or optimize your intervention with IVERS or imaging before uh, interruption. That is probably safer. So uh, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. I would, uh, I would like Dr. Uzma and Dr. Ambar Ashraf because they are just silently listening to us. And can you please give some comments on our today's discussion to conclude this discussion? Uh, this is Dr. Uzma. And this was really a very interesting session for me. I think I learned more than I've ever learned about cardiac disease in pregnancy. I must say that Dr. Lopez's presentation was impressive. Uh, I think looking at all that data was really nice. Uh, one thing is uh, something mentioned right towards the end about the multidisciplinary team. And so many times that's something that we have to really work on developing in Pakistan because uh, the patients tend to have this uh, thought process that it's the consultant that they should be going to. And they don't realize that there is a whole team that they should work at. Um, I, I think in uh, Dr. Ambar, I really appreciate her bringing up the uh, conditions with increasing ischemic diseases. Uh, maybe in the future, we might be seeing uh, more women in Pakistan uh, because there's metabolic syndrome that's increasing, there's hyperlipidemia that's increasing, there's obesity that's increasing. Keep in mind, I'm the endocrinologist here, I'm not a cardiologist. So it's uh, I think, uh, one thing I, uh, Dr. Sabine's presentation, I think uh, uh, it should be included in every specialty lecture because so many times we don't even know what contraceptive options to offer to our patients. And I'll say I myself refer the patient to the gynecologist. We need to be educated about all of that. Uh, and I'm really very impressed by Dr. Shoaib Nisa's uh, excellent overview. Uh, it was a very tough presentation. I don't know how she managed to put everything in about 20 minutes and go through it. I hope I can get a copy of these presentations uh, and refer to them later. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent presentations, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Oh, oh. Are you thank there? you, yes. Jeff. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. It's really a very wonderful, informative symposium. And especially from the top, all of us has updated our existing knowledge. And the data which was shared here is really very interesting. And it's a high time we must have our own data of Pakistan regarding uh, rheumatic heart disease and pregnancies, ischemic heart disease and pregnant women's cardiomyopathy, even 
peripartum cardiomyopathies and pregnant ladies. Uh, with uh, Professor Dr. Ishtayak Prasun, already we are working on rheumatic heart disease and pregnant women because it's a high time. We must have to identify these groups very well in time so that we start doing a preventive measures and the preventive clinics regarding these particular diseases. The talks which really delivers, that's wonderful, fantastic, the data in a very short time as uh, Professor Allen uh, shared, it's a wonderful and we must have to have our own data. Regarding Professor Dr. Amber Malik's talk, always uh, it's a wonderful uh, way she present or uh, but that's really very impressive and nice way of presenting and especially for our younger upcoming PGs, that's very essential. They should identify these uh, rheumatic heart disease, ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathies in pregnant women very well in time so that we can do a pre uh, pregnancy counseling sessions. And that should be a mandatory component of all tertiary care as well as at the district level hospitals so that we prevent uh, the complications during uh, the term and after the pregnancy, at the delivery and postpartum time. So that's a really a good thing from this we can conclude in that way. Regarding Dr. Sabina's talk on oh, contraceptive measures and how to go through it, this very nice and we must have our close collaborations and we must have our uh, cardio obstructive teams. And in Khyber Teaching Hospital, we already developed a small departmental uh, activity where uh, for especially rheumatic heart disease patients, when they're coming for antenatal booking, we have a combined clinics with our gynecologist and a cardiologist. And that's why we have their regular uh, pre, uh, if they most of the time they come when they are pregnant and we have their uh, echo, uh, echocardiograms in order to to evaluate the parameters and follow them at five months and post-pregnancy and that's really very important. Now, thank you for sharing all this and uh, Dr. Subhanish Sa, she talked very well. It was a very large topic and how to manage all these cases and we are really impressed and uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my comments. Uh, and really, we are looking forward for such type of the symposias and academic activities. Thank you very much. And special thanks to Professor Dr. Khalida Sumru. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, because it does this very interesting topic, and I'm very much interested in rheumatic heart disease. I know that I'm prolonging the session, but it is really very uh, practical question, and Dr. Ambar Asha urged it. Uh, because rheumatic heart disease and pregnancy, you know, it's a very, very unique population. This is the only cardiology, uh, cardiac disease which can be cured, you know. And therefore, I wanted to ask, uh, we are here, uh, sitting president of Asia Pacific Cardiac Society and the representative from the Philippines, how the situation is of uh, rheumatic prophylaxis in your country. And really, if we can work together in this aspect, and we can cure our people, we can prevent from the rheumatic heart disease, and it is especially for the female, it is very important. Yes. Before Dr. Tax says anything, what like to say is that rheumatic heart disease actually is not a cure, it is not curable, but we can prevent it if we uh, adopt the measures right from the beginning from when a person has sore throat where you can start giving them prophylactic antibiotics and if you have a raised ASO titer and things like that. So I think prevention becomes important and uh, we actually have presented a lot of data from there from Federal Government Services Hospital in this respect in the beginning. Once rheumatic heart disease comes into play, it is, it, it is not curative. You may be able to inhibit or reduce it or 
uh, hamper the progress of it. But otherwise, uh, I don't think that uh, you can cure rheumatic heart disease. I understand that. I am not talking in that perspective to <laughs> rheumatic heart disease. I meant to say that when there is a rheumatic fever, you can prevent the development of rheumatic heart disease. In that term, you can cure it. That is in inverted commas. I understand your, your point of view. Yes. In the uh, Philippines, uh, just one comment. Here in the Philippines, we're doing a prophylaxis, but this is under the purview of the pediatric cardiologist. We get support from the Department of Health. So they are the ones providing the uh, antibiotics. And the, our uh, colleagues from the pediatric departments are the ones uh, instituting the uh, prophylaxis. They are closely monitoring these patients. I do not have exactly the data that they have. But that is an ongoing project that is uh, being done here in the Philippines. Right. Thank you, Dr. Gubis. Uh, thank you, everyone, all the panelists. And now I would uh, like to uh, call upon for speaking uh, Dr. Kalda Sumro. She does not need an introduction. The most uh, impressive female in, in the Society of Cardiology in Pakistan is Dr. Professor Dr. Kalda Sumro. She is currently the chairman of the Scientific Council of Pakistan Cardiac Society, and she is leading the GORED Women Program in Pakistan. Looking at her every day, I thought that uh, when I would be in her age, or maybe uh, uh, 10 years after, maybe I be that energetic that she is today. So uh, without uh, any introduction I, uh, and delays, I would like to call upon Dr. Khalda Sungu to close the ceremony for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Salam Khalda. It has been an honor and a privilege to clear for me and my team members of Scientific Council of Women with Heart Diseases of Pakistan Cardiac Society to be among such an accomplished people to present our perspective before you. Despite the highest prevalence of the heart disease in Asia, especially in developing countries of the South Asia, there is more toxicity of the data in the air. In, uh, on the epidemiology of these disorders and their exact care and mortality. Especially data in women with heart diseases during the pregnancy. We don't have uh, much data in our country, uh, I think uh, in, in neighboring countries as well. And we still stand in the last century in this matter when there was less uh, research work on the women. I'm sure Dr. Elvina Lopez will agree with me on this fact. The difficulty she might have in finding the data for our preparation of her talk, especially from the developing countries. In Pakistan, situation is not even good. Only few articles I found and decided to uh, uh, so one of the articles, which was very impressive, and they, so I decided to call this, uh, her first author, that was the Dr. Shredi Musa, and they, uh, so taking the advantage of presence of President of Asia Pacific Society with us, I will request him to take combined efforts of the data collection through the respective members of the society if not possible for the whole Asia, then South Asian countries about prevalence of the cardiac disease, especially pregnant women, where the, the situation is more worse than the rest of the uh, Asia Pacific. The, this topic I choose deliberately to draw the attention of President APSC to focus our attention on the data collection to make appropriate guidelines for women of the developing countries of the South Asia. Thank you so much for your questions listening during the webinar. And I wish you all a very good evening. Goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Sumbu. Thank you, Dr. Shahbaz. I would like to say something. Khalda, are you done? Yes. Uh, the, uh, because your moderator kept unmuting me again and again. I was not given a chance to speak, so I will not. I had to make a couple of very practical and useful points, but she kept unmuting me. 
And Dr. Okay. Shehbaz Quraish, she pointed it out that I wasn't given. Okay. Okay then. Thank you. We should request Dr. Nusrat to make her comments because they are always very valuable and a few couple of minutes would not do any harm. Oh, but what's the use of inviting as a panelist? The moderator kept unmuting me time and again. I just wanted, you know, I no, always sir. give very short press comments. Yeah. I don't think she did it purposefully. It must have happened by chance. No, but every her... anyway, so since Dr. Shabazz, you have asked me, my first comment was regarding counseling. And I think Dr. Feroz Maimon sto has stolen my words. I'm always very particular about that, that counseling, not only the girl's family, but always the boy's family when they are planning a pregnancy. I think Dr. Feroz Maimon explained that. My second point was, we all kept talking about uh, pregnancies in diagnosed rheumatic or congenital heart diseases forgetting that still there are 4% of normal pregnancies. I mean, the pregnancies in women without any prior heart disease or any sign of symptoms, but they end up in cardiovascular complications. So this is the group which needs to be evaluated very carefully. And the commonest problem that we all see in second and third trimester is the pregnancy induced hypertension. And you must have noticed the gynecologists, they write two, three antihypertensive medication that are popular with them. And that is the end of the story. The patient is discharged without warning or without telling them that this thing may happen again. And this invariably happens when I take history of an elderly lady who is in 50s or 60s. And I ask her about her obstetrical history and they get bugged off. Sab, I'm already 57, why are you taking? And invariably the answer will be that out of four or five pregnancies, three or four, during three or four, she had pregnancy-induced hypertension, which ultimately ends up at that. And with the present generation, we see the incidence of PCOs is very common. Unhealthy lifestyle and uh, so, I think even in a normal girl or a lady in second trimester or third, an EKG and an electrocardiogram is a must, which should serve as a baseline investigation. And by doing that, we may pick up some abnormalities that the lady may have during her um, successive pregnancies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahbaz. Thank you, Pablo. Hi, Dr. Dostal. Can you hear me? Yes. Dr. Nisret, we cannot mute or unmute anyone. We, we don't have uh, that. No, you I, did. You invited all the eyes. Kept looking at the sign. Every second minute it was, the host has unmuted. I would again I'm not myself. And, uh, anyway, I and Dr. Ishtiak are just moderating. We cannot mute or unmute anyone. I'm sorry. Okay, if, okay. thank you. All right. So, so uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jack, uh, yes, can you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I yes. just want to thank everyone for coming on to this session. Um, I, I think I heard a lot of uh, suggestions about how to improve uh, for this group. I think uh, in our region, we must acknowledge a few things. First, we don't have enough data that is pertinent for us to manage uh, public health issues in our country. We need to continuously work towards that. I will ask each respective country to gather their internal data first before we do a collaborative effort across Asia Pacific. Knowing that rheumatic heart disease, primary care is still a huge issue, I would suggest people focus on those type of data sets uh, first. Uh, secondly, I think for this group of women and women in cardiovascular care in general, I think it's still very much uh, underserved underappreciated uh, uh, unmet needs. So I think we need to continue to work on that and uh, we will improve on that. I, I, I'm about to do another webinar just to talk about women's heart health across Asia PAC and uh, how much of a gap that is. I'll be the sole male participant for that uh, uh, webinar. Thirdly, I think for pregnancy and women's heart disease, a multidisciplinary approach is always welcome. I heard uh, the gynecologist 
the cardiologist and not forgetting probably the primary health physician in a lot of countries, they need to be really involved. And in some countries, probably even the nursing educators uh, will, will need to be uh, engaged. And sometimes don't forget the NGOs uh, as well as the public health advocate, advocacy groups, they, they will come in helpful. So, so I think in, when the resources are scarce and the need is great, uh, we should be more resourceful. Uh, the last bit about webinars like this is that I think uh, three hours is probably a bit too long. I think maybe we can try to keep the webinar a bit more concise on one topic. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Uh, my free Wi-Fi was used. Thank up. you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good afternoon.